Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku met Monster Girls part 2. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 3rd comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story Jajaflow from fanfiction.net. So let's start the video. After sleeping off her tantrum midnight went to see her mother. The demon lord was the only person besides Yuri that could open a portal to Wonderland without fail. She sighed at the childish way her sister was acting. She knew as well as the rest of her sisters that their mother's magic was finite. Making her do this would only exhaust her further. But this was Midnight's last course of action. There's no telling what kind of man held their father's power and if he wasn't a good man or he could be in danger. Shuriri had the most mana among her sisters, but that did not mean she couldn't be overcome. Midnight sighed as she walked into the library seeing her mother sitting on a love seat with a book in her hand and a bottle of essence on a nearby table. Your Majesty, Midnight said with a bow only for Nana's grey eyes to look at her. She sat up slowly as if making a conscious effort to not exert any more than the absolute minimum. Nana sighed but smiled at Midnight. Midnight you don't have to call me that when we're alone. Honestly, you don't have to call me that at all. But I know how you like to stand on ceremony, so at least call me mother when we're alone. She said as she patted the seat next to her. Now come and have a seat. Midnight looked at the couch cushion before sitting on her ample backside upon the cushion. Nana smiled at the younger woman before running her hand through her hair. See isn't this better? She asked. Now what is it you wanted to speak about? Nana questioned her daughter as Midnight sighed. It's Ari, mother. The man I've been looking for escaped into Wonderland and when I asked for Ari's assistance she misinterpreted what I was saying and refused to allow me entry to Wonderland. I need you to speak with Eri, mother, and make her open a portal allowing me and my subordinates entry, or barring that you'll have to open a portal yourself. I don't want it to have to come to that, but Eri might leave us no choice. I know that we can capture the man in Wonderland without him escaping again. Nana leaned back not stopping in her stroking of Midnight's hair. Honestly, she found it quite soothing. Midnight remembered when her mother used to do this for her as a child along with her father. Oh Midnight, you know how fragile Eri is. She's so powerful, but so young at the same time. She's not the like the rest of your sisters and you shouldn't try to treat her as such. Still, I understand your worry about her. You think this man may be a threat to us and you're worried that could end badly for Iri. Nana stood up and sighed. Very I will speak with Iri. I can't promise that I'll get through to her. But if I don't I will try to open a portal for you if my mana will be sufficient. She said taking a sip of the white liquid in her glass before walking to a mirror and using her magic to make a connection to Wonderland. It took only a moment before the connection was made and Nana could see into the darkened interior of Eri's room. She could spot the mound of silver hair on the pillows as she slept and Nana couldn't help but give an awe at the sight. Her little girl the last gift her husband gave her before he disappeared was sleeping so soundly. It had been so long since Eri had moved to Wonderland. Her mana was too much for the demon world and threw it out of balance. It hurt to have her daughter so far from her, but it was for the best, and over time Eri had made Wonderland her own. Nana dispersed the viewing mirror the image of Eri being replaced with her own reflection. Midnight jumped to her feet looking at her mother. Mother why didn't you ask Eri anything? Midnight shouted as her mother turned to her. Come on Mitty I couldn't wake her up she was so cute lying there in bed sound asleep. I promise I'll talk to her in the morning. But for now, let's have her rest. She said walking back and sitting on the love seat once more. But mother, the longer we leave him to wander around Wonderland the worst it could be we should move now. Suddenly Midnight was snatched off her feet and found her head in Nana's lap with her mother stroking her hair again. Midnight would never admit it, but she had thought such displays of strength were far beyond what her mother was capable of nowadays. Obviously, her assumption was wrong. S-H-H-H-H-H Midi it's okay. Everything will be fine for one more night. She whispered. Midnight's face blushed at the use of her childish nickname. But mom, Nana pressed her finger to Midnight's lips. Just relax for a little while longer Midnight. I know how hard you've been working to keep everything under control. You've really stepped up since your father's disappearance and even though they may not say it your sisters appreciate you. Nana said stroking Midnight's cheek as the younger woman began to slowly relax. And so do I she said before kissing Midnight's forehead. There was a clanging that brought Momo out of her dreamless sleep. Her ebon eyes fluttered open as she noticed a light growing brighter illuminating her abode as it drew closer. Momo was in a cell lying on the stone slab that ejected from the wall to serve as her bed. She sat up slowly her body protesting with pain from her uncomfortable seat. As she sat up she heard movement in the cells across from her. She stood up and walked to the thick wooden door of her cell. It was made from sturdy oak with thick iron bands across it strengthening it even more. Momo wasn't sure even an ogre could break down this door. The door was further fortified by a collection of runes around the door gem preventing her from casting magic. There was a small barred window at the top of the door that Momo looked through seeing the light from the approaching torch reflected in Yurara's brown eyes. 
unlike Momo Yurara was held in what amounted to a cage. The front of her cell was composed entirely of iron bars with a thick iron door being the only exit. Irara growled as four figures appeared. Two of the figures were familiar to the two prisoners. There were the five and three of spades. It was the other two that worried Momo. They also wore black outfits like the spades, but instead of that symbol upon their stomachs was emblazoned a black club. Momo swallowed knowing exactly why those two were there. Members of the club suit were powerful magic users and seeing as both of them had two clubs each it was safe to say these two were strong. If it was just one of them Momo might be able to overwhelm her, but two that was nigh impossible. The five of spades slammed the butt of her sword against Urara's cage narrowly missing her fingers gripping the bars. Step away from the bars. She commanded and Urara reluctantly obeyed as she took two steps back allowing the three of spades to open her door. Five then turned to Momo. You as well step away from the door. Momo did as she was told stepping back into the darkness of her cell before hearing a key being inserted into the lock. There was a slight whine as the mechanism was turned and then the door was open showering Momo in the light from one of the club's wands. Momo had thought they were carrying torches but the light had come from their staffs. Put your hands out in front of you. Five commanded and once more Momo complied before a pair of deep red handcuffs in the shape of hearts was clamped around her wrist. The two club soldiers stepped to the side ushering Momo out. As soon as she was out of the cell she felt her magic return to her before the two clubs locked their staffs about her neck. It was a simple but efficient warning. Even with her magic restored she would be no match for them. Momo tried to keep her face calm as she gave a slow nod of acceptance. The clubs held their staffs at her neck for a moment longer before they withdrew them. There was a growl to her left and Momo turned seeing the three of spades holding Urara down as five clamped a muzzle onto her face and handcuffed her. Is that really necessary you've already caught her? Momo shouted. Five stood to her feet as the three jerked Urara up to hers. Quiet prisoner you are not the one asking questions. Now march. Five shouted shoving Momo toward the stairs. For a moment Momo thought she'd fall flat on her face, but managed to catch herself and proceed up the staircase. As she walked up the stairs hearing the pad of Urara's feet on the stone and the click of their captor's boots on the steps behind her she thought about their capture. Momo and Urara had been forced through the face of the enlarged playing card and upon exiting out the other side they stood in a stone hall before a thick banded door. It had been night when the spades had captured them and moonlight streamed in through several towering windows. There was only one place in Wonderland with majesty like this. They were in the Heart Castle. One of the spades walked to the door and opened it with no sense of effort. You two will spend the night in the dungeon and speak to the queen in the morning. She and Eurora had been ushered down into the dungeon and left there until now. Now that the castle was lit by sunlight she could see all the small details that she'd missed in coming here in the dark. The walls were carved every few feet with a large heart and a slight miasma hung in the air. Pink smoke wafted across the ceiling. Mom was jabbed in the back to make her move again. Go to the left. Five instructed and Momo walked. She followed Spade's instructions turning when she was told to turn and stopping when they arrived at their destination. The six of them all stood in front of a pair of massive bright red doors. Out of the corner of her eye, Momo noticed that each of the queen's women were looking themselves over making sure there wasn't a single thread out of place. Once they were satisfied the lead Spade knocked three times on the door. There wasn't even a moment's pause with the door seeming to open as soon as her fist connected with it a third time. The room before them was opulent, to say the least. Chandeliers hung from the ceiling billowing out that pink smoke that Momo had seen when exiting the dungeon. There was a plush carpet that ran the length of the room starting at the door and ending under the feet of the queen's throne. As the group walked in Momo finally came face to face with the queen of hearts. She was a child in form her feet not even reaching the ground from where she perched on her throne. Her bright red shoes kicked back and forth as she bounced on her throne. Her horns were polished as bright as her shoes as was her crown. Her vertical pupils nestled within those bright red eyes focused on them with abject curiosity. Before she knew it Momo's knees were kicked out dropping her to a kneeling position same as Urara. She hissed as her knees slammed into the carpeted stone. My queen I the five of spades present to you two intruders in Wonderland. I have cause to believe they know of the boy you seek. She said with a curtsy mirrored by the other three members of her squad. Momo looked up at the Queen of Hearts and noticed a massive portrait hanging behind her throne. The figure was a demon in all respects. Bright blonde hair trailed down his back and over his shoulders like a golden mane. His chest was massive and rippling with muscles. Piercing blue eyes stared out at her from the painting as Momo's eyes moved down the majestic painting. The demon had goat legs in the same color as his hair. But aside from his eyes what stood out next was the golden horns adorning his head. Momo swallowed as she stared at the demon. This was most certainly an incubus and unless she was mistaken this was the last true demon lord. 
Momo was brought from her inspection by the click of shoes. Her eyes trailed down to the throne that was now empty and then traveled lower seeing the Queen of Hearts step off the final step placing her at even height with Momo before her forehead was pressed to the ground by the club soldier holding her. Hearing a muffled thud as the same thing was done to Urara. You did well five. The young voice of the Queen of Hearts rang out. Good girl, well done. Iri patted the head of the five of spades who blushed heavily as she relished the affection visited upon her by her queen. Every citizen of Wonderland lived to please their queen, but none more so than her chosen soldiers. Their every breath was devoted to her and making her happy. All too soon the praise and head pats ceased. Five desired more but held herself back from begging for it. The queen's attention had to be earned. Now bring them out onto the balcony. I haven't yet had breakfast and I would be delighted for these two to join us. Free them from their bonds so they may eat, unless you and your soldiers wish to feed them by hand. She said with a giggle as she skipped over to the glass terrace door that was opened by a pair of imps. Momo and Yurara were jerked to their feet and their handcuffs along with Yurara's muzzle were removed. They were pushed toward the balcony it seemed that they were finally allowed to move on their own rather than being dragged from place to place. Momo felt Yurara grip her hand as the two walked forward into the bright morning of Wonderland. When her eyes adjusted Momo was shocked at the breakfast that was being provided. She'd expected slices of ham or maybe eggs, or considering they were in the presence of royalty maybe omelets. Instead, she was greeted by pancakes topped with whipped cream and powdered sugar, along with crepes stuffed to the brim with an assortment of fruits. There were towers of cupcakes, tea cakes, cookies, and bowls heaped with ice cream and drowned in chocolate syrup among other various desserts. Momo sat down looking at the cavalcade of sweets and wondering how this was considered breakfast. She looked across the table seeing the queen's plate being prepared. A hefty slice of cake beside a crepe and several pancakes heaped with syrup. Yuri took a bite of the cake and leaned to the side and squealed at the delicious sweetness of it all. Her bright red eyes popped open looking at Momo and Yurara. Please go ahead and eat. I know you must be hungry after spending the night in the dungeon. Sorry about that. I was asleep by the time you arrived so to keep me safe my trump arts kept you down there, for my sake. She said with a giggle. Momo looked at the table of sweets and was about to decline the queen's offer before seeing the glares of the quartet of trump hearts. Their eyes said it all. Eight. Momo sighed and looked at Yurara before giving a nod. The two of them chose a small sampling of what was available to them. A crepe for Momo and several pancakes scraped free of whipped cream for Yurara. Yuri leaned forward smiling at the two watching them eat. So what are your names? Yuri asked jovially. Momo swallowed one of the cherries she'd picked out of the crepe. I am the witch Momo and this is my companion Yurara the Kobold, she said with a small smile. We are honored to eat at your table your majesty, but we would like to know why we're here, Momo asked as Queen Uri leaned back kicking her legs. Oh, of course, you're here Bikau. Before Uri could finish her sentence she felt a small pulse of magic from the hand mirror she kept in her pocket. She knew the magic was from her mother and nearly panicked as she reached into her pocket before looking at her guests. I'll answer your question in just a moment Momo. My mother is calling and I have to answer, but I'd rather not of her know you two are here so would you both be so kind as to eat quietly until I'm done, please. As that word left her mouth a wave of mana enveloped the area. It was so thick and potent that both Momo and Yurara felt as if they were practically breathing it in. Momo knew the queen by reputation, but here and now sitting in the maelstrom of her mana she knew without a doubt Uri deserved every bit of fear and respect that reputation had earned her. It took a massive effort on Momo's part to shake her head in agreement. Yurara could simply sit there and stare at the queen until her mana was restrained once more. Lovely, Yuri said as she pulled out the mirror having it face her as her mother's face appeared on the reflective surface. Hello, mother, and good morning to you. She said with a small smile as she looked at Nana who returned the smile with all her motherly warmth. Good morning to you Turi my sweet I trust you slept well. Yuri nodded happily. Very well mother are you feeling well after Rukyu upset you a few days ago? Yuri asked hoping to keep her mother from asking too much about her or her realm. She hadn't yet found the boy that Midnight was hunting and if her mother asked she'd have to tell her the truth. She could never lie to her mother. Of course my sweet I'm fine. I just got a little excited back then, but that's all over now. Anyway, I heard that you and Midnight had a slight disagreement. She asked but of course, she already knew the truth considering that Midnight was sitting out of sight a few feet away. Do you want to tell me about it? She asked as Ari's cheeks puffed up in frustration. If Momo didn't know who she was looking at she would say Ari was the cutest thing she'd ever seen. Thiri leaned back into her chair not looking at her mother. She doesn't think I can do anything on my own. Thiri pouted. I didn't say that. Midnight shouted as she jumped to her feet. But thankfully Nana had used her magic to keep Thiri from hearing her voice. She cast her grey eyes in Midnight's direction and taking the hint Midnight sat down again. Now Thiri I'm sure Midnight did not intend for her words to sound like that. She just wants to help. This boy could be very dangerous. He has your father's powers. After all, there's no telling what he might do with them. At this Urara's jaw dropped and Momo dropped her fork the utensil clattering on the stone balcony. 
Now everything made sense. Momo had been wondering who it was that had brought Izuku to the demon realm and gifted him with the powers of a fully-fledged incubus and now she knew. He was a demon with dark yellow fur and wings. Izuku's description of the male demon had made no sense to Momo because the past demon lord had disappeared long before she was born and no one outside of those close to royalty would know what the demon lord had looked like. Now thinking back to the golden demon in the portrait above Iri's throne everything had come together. Izuku is the chosen vessel of the former demon lord. Irara had always known her master was special after all his mana was so delicious and felt so good. Her master had the power of the demon lord and she had been chosen by him. She was rubbing her thighs together so hard she was afraid she might catch fire. She belonged to the new demon lord. She couldn't keep the blush from her face as she stared ahead in awe. Nana continued trying to persuade Iri. So please dear open a portal for your sister to come and get the boy and then she'll be gone. I promise she won't mess with anything else in Wonderland. Nana bargained. Iri turned her head away from her mother who sighed. I can take care of him by myself I don't want big sister Midnight to come here. She whined only for Nana to shake her head. Iri you know your father hated when you girls fought. This is very important to all of us so please work with your sister on it. You can spend some time together. I know it must get lonely in Wonderland with none of us being able to visit often and you not being able to stay long when you come here. Iri looked back at her mother and frowned before nodding. Okay mother, midnight can come, but I'm not letting her in the castle she can go anywhere else. She said crossing her arms. Midnight rolled her eyes but nodded. Fine, I won't go near the castle. She said as Nana nodded. It wasn't what she would have liked, but it was a compromise. Thank you, Iri that was very mature of you. She said as Midnight rolled her eyes and stood up. Iri nodded proud of herself. I'll open the portal after I get done eating breakfast. She said waving at her mother. I promise. She added after crossing her heart. Nana smiled. She'll be waiting. Goodbye, sweetheart. Nana said as the two broke the magical connection they had through the mirror. Midnight stood behind her mother with her arms crossed. You baby her too much, you and father both did. Midnight groused as Nana just giggled. Don't be jealous Midi I baby all of you more than you'll ever know. Iri looked at her mirror making sure the magical connection had been severed completely before speaking to her guest. Sorry about that, now where were we? She asked, but before Momo could explain Iri spoke again. Oh right, you were going to tell me where that human boy is. She said and once more the Queen of Hearts mana washed over the area even more potent and heavy than before. Momo felt like her entire body was being wrapped up in a giant thick blanket. And from the way Yurara was panting, she could assume she was feeling the same. Even the trumparts gave slight flinches as the mana swirled around the area. Momo swallowed as she looked into Iri's glittering eyes. She couldn't fathom lying to her and luckily she didn't have to. Izuku awoke to the sound of singing. It was beautiful gently rousing him from his slumber. Surely a sweet maiden must be singing to him. But as he looked around he was greeted by a blue and green checkered bird singing with the voice of a grand songstress. He just shook his head as he got to his feet refusing to be shocked by anything else Wonderland had to offer. He looked around seeing his guide asleep in a tree. Her eyes closed as slow breaths pushed past her full lips. Izuku felt an intense pull towards her as his stomach growled. He licked his lips as he began to climb the tree. He'd climbed trees growing up so looking for purchase on this one wouldn't be too hard. In fact, it was exceedingly easy as he found himself hovering over Pixabob who was still slumbering away. Now that he was within inches of her he could take in her scent so uniquely feminine and it only made his hunger harder to ignore. In the deepest corner of his mind, he could hear himself resisting shouting out to stop and not to give in to his hunger. But it was too faint. Izuku had gone without for long enough. He pounced upon Pixabob latching his lips onto hers. Her blue eyes shot open and roved around their sockets before settling on him and then feeling the powerful lust emanating from Izuku and overwhelming her body. She moaned as she felt her mana being pulled out of her and her body burning with lust at his touch. Before she gave in and ruined her queen's catch she teleported away from Izuku landing only a few feet away on the ground. He'd siphoned a good portion of her mana away resulting in a teleport that was barely more than a hop. She moaned as she tried to get to her feet only to hear the thud of Izuku's feet hitting the ground behind her. She shivered as she turned to look at him. Green mana was wafting off him like thick fog his eyes glowed with lust and his body rippled with strength. Pixabob knew she wouldn't be able to escape him. He'd ravage her once he caught her and any resistance she put up would be futile. Not that she was against any of that she'd be more than happy to submit to him, but she couldn't betray her queen. Izuku listen to me you need to take a breath just you know calm down and breathe. I know you're hungry, but if you wait I can take you to someone who will be able to fulfill every desire you have and then some. Just take a moment, she said but it was clear Izuku was not listening to her as he ran toward her at a speed much greater than a normal human could manage. Pixabob closed her eyes and prepared for Izuku to have his way with her. She waited one moment then another and another, but still nothing happened. She hesitantly opened her eyes and saw the spectacle before her. Izuku was caught in a web of pink slime. He struggled as the slime began to strip him of all his new clothes until he was wearing nothing at all. 
Every moment Izuku struggled before the slime took the form of a pink girl. Husband I'm here. The slime spoke garnering Izuku's attention. He launched himself up to her locking onto her mouth and kissing her. Having just experienced the sensation Pixabob knew all too well what was happening. The slime jiggled as Izuku kissed her his hands roving across her body growing slick with her moisture. I'll take care of you now. She said as her slime spread across his lower half engulfing his throbbing cock. Izuku growled and threw his head back the slime got to work playing with his cock. Pixabop thought about stopping this, but she had a feeling that if she got too close Izuku's eyes would wander to her again. I'm sorry my queen just this once, she thought to herself. Letting this slime have Izuku for the moment was a small price to pay rather than giving herself to him and spoiling her queen's prize. She sat down on the ground with her legs spread. There was no reason she shouldn't enjoy the show. Pixabob brought her paw down to her panties which had been drenched under Izuku's first assault and slid them to the side. Her pussy was weeping as she stroked it up and down pressing hard against her clit on the upstroke as she watched the slime work Izuku's cock. Oh, husband I'm so glad I have found you. She moaned as Izuku thrust up into her. Yes, use me husband as much as you want. I'll take all your essence. She moaned as Izuku's powerful hips drove his cock all the way to her chest. She could feel him pulling away her mana to satisfy his hunger. And that was fine when he came that would give her all she needed. She relished the feel of his cock plunging into her depths shaking every inch of her as he drank in her mana and she his pleasure. Izuku sunk his hands into her body as he thrust up into her over and over again. Pixabob stroked her pussy faster and faster with each pump of Izuku's cock into the slime. The fur of her paw was drenched in her arousal her pussy gushed its juices dribbling onto the forest floor. Izuku thrust up into the pink slime a final time and threw its translucent body. Pixabob saw Izuku's cum jettison from his flared tip in slow motion. The thick white stream reached almost all the way to the slime's throat before stopping and then dispersing throughout her body as another shot of cum flowed into her. As volley after volley of cum flowed into the slime Pixabob noticed a transformation take place. The slime grew from its small size to the size of the average woman with hefty liquid breasts and wide hips. The slime moaned as she devoured Izuku's potent essence. She felt so full and powerful. She leaned over looking into Izuku's eyes as they returned to normal. Husband, are you okay now? She asked as Izuku blinked a couple of times before focusing on her. I am now thanks to you. Izuku focused on the slime before him realizing that since he'd met this slime he hadn't given her a name. She owed her sentience to him apparently. He should take responsibility for her. I am thanks to you Ashido. He said giving her a name finally. Was it a great name probably not, but it was hers. Ashido covered her mouth as she reveled in her new name. This meant that Izuku had finally acknowledged her as his just like. Ashido's eyes widened as she hopped off Izuku and started to gather his clothes tossing them at him. Husband we have to go Momo and Yurara are in trouble. She shouted remembering why she'd traveled so tirelessly in pursuit of Izuku. Izuku moved slowly at first as the aftershocks of his orgasm ran their course. He started to get dressed when he heard that Momo and Yurara were in trouble. What happened where are they Ashido? Izuku asked dressing quickly. Ashido looked back at Izuku seeing that he seemed to have his wits about him now. The Trumpards took them to the Queen of Hearts. She shouted. Izuku felt his chest go cold as he heard the Queen of Hearts had Momo and Yurara. He looked at Pixabub sitting on the grass licking her own juices from her paw after a powerful orgasm. Izuku walked over to Pixabob and lifted her to her feet with ease. She wanted to marvel at his strength before he cupped her chin and locked eyes with her. Once more Izuku's eyes glowed making her unable to turn away. Take us to the Queen of Hearts, he said and the look in his eyes was so mesmerizing. A green sheen swept over Pixabob's eyes and the only thing she could think of was doing what he said as quickly as possible. Okay Izuku I'll take you to the queen. She said wrapping her paw around Izuku's hand who in turn wrapped his other hand around Ashido's. Soon enough the trio were no longer in the clearing. Midnight waited more than an hour in her room before he finally opened a portal for her to enter Wonderland. She knew her little sister was just being petty, but she had to accept it. After all, no matter Iri's feelings she had opened the portal for her. Finally this can come to a close, she said as she entered Wonderland. Midnight looked up expecting to see the cotton candy pink of Wonderland's sky instead the sky above her was dark and stormy. Midnight frowned knowing full well that all of Wonderland was under Eerie's control and so the weather could be whatever she wanted it to be. Midnight felt a drop land on her nose before a heavy downpour fell on her. Midnight growled as she raised a hand to create a shield of magic over her head. You're being very immature Eerie, but no matter throw your tantrum I will find that boy. She said as she activated her mana sight and saw a thick trail of green mana leading out of these dark woods into a brighter area. Midnight wasted no time in following the mana. It didn't take her long to find where the trail terminated and she growled. There was only one creature in Wonderland that could teleport successfully in Wonderland and that was Eri's pet the Cheshire Cat. Very clever Eri dumped me off in the middle of nowhere while you hold the boy in your clutches. Midnight's blue mana spiked off her in frustration as she tore open a portal and walked through it. 
I have had enough of this eerie. She shouted as she found herself on a beach looking out at a black and red checkered ocean. And of course, you're not going to simply let me teleport into your castle, but that's fine. I won't stop until I get near your castle and then walk from there. Forget the promise I made this ends here. She said stepping through a different portal to places unknown to her. Gary looked at Momo and Yura who had been brought in from the balcony and were now on their knees with the swords of the spade soldiers at their necks. I don't have time to be polite anymore. I need to find that boy before my sister does. And you two came with him here so I refuse to believe that you don't know where he is. I'm going to ask you one more time. Where is the boy? Momo was acutely aware of the feeling of cold steel on the back of her neck, but she couldn't answer the queen's question. I told you we don't know. We separated from him when we got here and lost sight of him. That's all we. Silence. Yuri shouted her mana spiking out and cracking the ground and walls even shattering several windows. If you won't tell me where he is then I have no use for you. Off with their heads. She shouted at the top of her lungs. Momo and Yurara's eyes widened at the death sentence. We're telling the truth you can't kill us for not knowing the answer to your question. Yurara shouted. Up until now, she'd thought it better to let Momo speak and handle everything. But this was all she could take. If she was going to die either way without seeing her master again then so be it but she wouldn't die without a fight. Iri's eyes swung to Yurara nearly freezing her heart in her chest. Start with the dog. Her voice was low but fierce lancing through her chest. The spade soldier behind her raised her sword high. As you wish my queen. She said bringing the sword down only for a burst of mana to throw her to the side. Everyone in the throne room turned to the presence that had just appeared. It was Izuku standing there in a maelstrom of green mana. At his side, Ashido stood with a relieved smile on her face, and at his feet was an exhausted Pixabob. She looked up at Izuku the green sheen in her eyes slowly fading as she realized what she'd done and where she'd taken him. Izuku looked at the four trumparts facing him. They'd left their prisoners to protect their queen. Behind the four women, he spotted a small girl with silver hair and red eyes. Atop her silver mane was a small crown with hearts adorning it. The Queen of Hearts, he said as Iri swallowed hard looking at him. She could feel the echoes of her father's magic on this boy, but they were faint slowly but surely the magic was becoming his and her father's presence would disappear. Izuku moved to Momo and Yurara stroking Yurara's ears as she shuddered under his touch. He moved to cup Momo's face as he looked at the two of them. I'm sorry it took me so long to find you again. He whispered to the two of them before giving each a quick kiss on the lips. Even from this quick exchange, both could tell that Izuku was very close to becoming an incubus. The physical changes were more defined. His eyes now constantly had a soft glow and his fingernails were sharp along with prominent fangs in his mouth. All he would need is one more push to complete the transformation. It's okay master we understand. Irara said nuzzling into his hand as Momo smiled with relief and nodded. Irara is right I told you to run and you did. And now you've come back for us. Thank you Izuku. She said as he stood up placing himself between them and the Queen of Hearts. The shock of Izuku's entrance had worn off on the young queen and she now put herself back in control. So you're the boy my sister has been searching for so frantically. You're not what I expected but you do have my father's mana. How did you get it? She asked letting her own red mana spread across the room. It was massive as it wrapped around Izuku's small pocket of mana. Izuku looked at her confused for a moment before shaking his head. I won't tell you anything until you promise that Momo, Yurara, and Ashido will be safe. You've been hunting for me not them. Yuri cocked her head to the side as she looked at the three monster women with him. She hadn't expected him to demand that of all things from her. After staying silent a moment she smiled showing her cute little fangs. I'll make a deal with you Izuku was it? I promise to keep not only your three toys safe, but you as well. Izuku narrowed his eyes at Iri's words, but he couldn't deny the power he was feeling. He wanted to say he had just as much but he had no control over it. Even just doing this keeping her mana from swallowing all of them was taxing his body. And what do you want in return? He asked as all his lovers clung to him. Iri smiled even wider if he didn't know what she was Izuku would say she was the cutest little girl he'd ever seen. Her silver hair was styled so perfectly right down to those ruby red eyes of hers. She was like a doll to be put away in a case and protected. Become my king of hearts and I'll make sure you want for nothing. All of Wonderland will be at your service to do with as you please. She said as she pulled a deck of cards from her dress and tossed them in the air. From them, 48 other trump hearts appeared. And of course, I too would be yours as well, Iri said walking towards Izuku with a lustful gleam in her eye. Izuku knew that the look she had should feel foreign on such a childish face. But in truth, Izuku felt like he was the child in the room when he looked at her. No Izuku you can't. She'll turn you, you will never be human again. And worse you'll belong to her forever. It was true that Momo had no real desire to help Izuku return to being a human and would prefer he become an incubus. But if he became one for the Queen of Hearts she would lose him, and she couldn't ever be okay with that. She's right master she just wants you for herself to become hers and hers alone. 
I don't want to leave you. I'm yours forever. I belong to you always. She shouted her claws digging into his pant leg as her big brown eyes swelled with tears. Even before she knew Izuku was the bearer of the Demon King's mana she'd wanted to be by his side. When he was just a confused scared boy in the demon realm she wanted to protect him and love him and be loved by him. He meant everything to her. They're right husband you can't sacrifice yourself for us. Ashido shouted wrapping herself tightly around him. He was the whole reason she could think for herself aside from thinking about food. She could speak because his mana had evolved her. She owed her very consciousness to him. She wouldn't let the Queen of Hearts take him if she could help it. So what do you say Izuku? Will you take my hand and become my king? Uri asked holding her hand out to him. Izuku was in the thick of it now. He'd stepped into the lion's den and was now on her menu and he wasn't sure there was anything he could do to stop her from devouring him whole. She was offering him a way out to become her king of hearts, but that would mean staying in Wonderland. Forever. He shook his head there had to be another way. He knew that becoming human again was no longer possible. He could feel that part of himself was almost gone. And he cared about Ashido, Momo, and Yurara too much to let them go or put them in danger by bringing them to the human world. So what could he do to make sure they would stay safe? There was no way or he would let them leave here. And if he resisted he had no doubt that she would just take him and do away with the others. She was the queen here and her word was law. There was no one above her. Or was there? He looked up at her as he made a decision. He couldn't run anymore he either had to step forward or be devoured. Izuku took a breath. I can't accept your proposal. Your majesty, Izuku said his green eyes trained on Iri as he felt her aura crash down on him shattering his small zone of mana and wrapping around him in the girls. Her red eyes glowed with anger. Why not? She shouted stomping her foot and creating fissures in the stone. Izuku took a labored breath as he looked back behind him seeing Yurara, Momo, and Ashido face down on the floor pinned by Iri's mana. Izuku looked back at Uri trying to stand as tall as possible while he spoke. I can't marry a queen without first seeking the approval of her parents, he said. It took Uri a moment to process what Izuku had just said and when she did the shock of it made her oppressive mana evaporate in an instant. Her ruby red eyes stared at Izuku as he approached her. Her trump arts immediately assumed a defensive position around her, but Izuku simply kneeled before Uri. I may possess the mana of a king but I Izuku Midoriya am a commoner your majesty. I cannot in good conscience take your hand without speaking to your parents and acquiring their blessing. Izuku was glad he was facing the ground that way or he wouldn't see the anxiety in his eyes. This was a massive wager. Izuku didn't know much about royalty, but in all the stories he'd read he knew it was customary for the husband to be to ask for the lady's hand in marriage. If that was the way it worked here at the very least it would get them out of Iri's clutches and maybe put their lives into someone with more steady hands. Iri crossed her arms as she stared down at Izuku. She pushed out her bottom lip and pouted because he was right. If he was going to marry her and become her king then he had to meet her mother. Uri waved her hand signaling her trump arts to stand down before she walked toward Izuku standing less than a foot away from him. Raise your head Izuku. She commanded and watched as Izuku lifted his head greeting her eyes with that deep calm green. She could get lost in those pools if she let herself. Uri blushed as she held out her hand. You are right if you are to marry me you must meet my mother. She has been looking for you as well, so this will be two birds with one stone. Izuku looked at Uri's hand before gently holding it in his as he stood. Uri blushed more feeling Izuku's strong calloused hands wrapping so gently around her own. It reminded her of her father and yet felt even better. Oh, that's right my sister was looking for you as well. She said waving a hand and opening a portal through which a frustrated midnight storm threw. Uri you have some nerve. She shouted her eyes glowing blue as they fell on her little sister and then to the young man holding her hand. She could immediately see small bits of her father's mana leaking from the boy, but for the most part that mana was his now. She was too late for the best case scenario. Midnight's plan had always been to find the boy before her father's power became integrated into his own mana and transfer it from him to her mother. If she caught it early enough then it wouldn't result in his death, but that was no longer an option. Transferring that power would definitely kill him now. Still, that wasn't too much of a moral hurdle for Midnight she'd gladly trade this boy's life for her mother's and her people. Very enough fun and games hand the boy over I'll be taking him to mother. Midnight said smoothing out her dress. Uri gave the cheekiest smile Midnight had ever seen on the M's face. Sorry big sister I'll be taking him and you to mother. I want her to meet my future husband. Uri said sticking her tongue out at Midnight whose face grew red at her sister's disrespect. Uri turned to Momo, Yurara, and Ashido. Well come on you three Izuku can't leave his toys just lying about now can he? She said with a smile. Momo took offense to being labeled as Izuku's toy, but she supposed that is how the Queen of Hearts would see them. She'd never consider them his wives or partners that would be too grand a title in her eyes. Still, Momo knew Izuku didn't see her or any of them that way and that was good enough for her. She watched as Yurara grabbed hold of Izuku's free hand and before she could say anything she then grabbed her own Momo felt the wet hand of her slime companion grip her hand and she smiled. 
They didn't have to fight for Izuku's attention they all knew he cared for them equally. Izuku looked back at the three women before following Iri into this portal. He could feel the cold gaze of the other succubus whom Iri had summoned and could tell she did not have any good intentions for him. He just took a breath and held his head high. He had to give a convincing show of confidence now more than ever. It wasn't just his life he had to worry about anymore. He was responsible for Urara, Momo, and Ashido now. Izuku and his group stepped through the portal into another castle this one was more mature and dark in Izuku's opinion. The light shining through the window was from a purple-tinted moon and would be repeatedly blocked out by thick black clouds. Izuku felt a prickle all over his body as if the air was charged and ready to receive a lightning strike. He gave a small shudder as he followed after the happy Eri as she bounded down the corridor eager to tell her mother the good news of her soon-to-be engagement. Midnight strode a bit faster to stand beside Izuku. He could feel the cold gaze on the side of his face. He looked out the corner of his eyes and locked them with Midnight's ice blue eyes. He was sure if it was possible he'd be frozen in an instant from her gaze. So you're the boy who has our father's mana, and what is your name boy? Izuku could feel the sheer weight of Midnight's authority crashing down on him. He swallowed as sweat beaded at his temple. His jaw was frozen not allowing him to speak. Answer me. She commanded only for Eri to step between the two of them. Stop at Midnight. He's my future and I will not allow you to do anything to him. There was a small delay before both their manas exploded in the hallway crashing against each other like a pair of tidal waves. Both glared at one another before the door they found themselves in front of opened and Izuku looked at the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. It wasn't a conscious thought, but it was the only thing that came to mind when looking at her. She was tall with black hair and grey eyes. Her skin was white as porcelain, but the muscles adorning her body looked as if they were chiseled from marble. Nana, he said making everyone turn to him. He didn't know why he said that or how he knew that was her name, but he just did. Her grey eyes locked onto Izuku and for a moment she swore she was looking at her husband again. The young blonde human with kind eyes and a glorious smile that could make even the demon lord's daughter fall for him. She swallowed before looking at her daughters. Stop this fighting you two I could feel your mana from the other side of the library. I would prefer you not show such unpleasantness to one another in front of our guests. As the other four members of this party were mentioned Iri immediately smiled and wrapped both her arms around Izuku's arm squeezing it against her chest. Oh, mother he's not just a guest he's going to be my king of hearts. She shouted happily as midnight rubbed her forehead. As you can see mother this is the person in possession of father's mana. I don't know what Ari is talking about, but now that we have him we should quickly take the mana he has and give it to you. Surely with father's mana, you'll be able to hold the demon realm together and we can finally stop worrying about our future. Izuku's eyes widened with hope at the mention of having this demonic mana taken from him. It was true he had given himself over to the idea that he would complete his transformation and live here with Urara and the others, but from what this succubus was saying he could still become human again. That thought was quickly dashed by what Eri said next. No, you can't do that it would kill him. You know that father's mana is pretty much gone at this point. Izuku has already absorbed his power and made it his own. If we strip that power from him he'll die. Urara, Momo, and Ashido stepped in front of Izuku protecting him in their own way. We won't let you hurt him. Urara growled as Midnight's cold blue eyes stared down at them. You act as if you have a choice. Instantly a blue sheen washed over the three women's eyes before they collapsed to their knees. W what did you do? Momo asked feeling all the strength drain from her body. It took all her energy just to look up at midnight. To her left Ashida was barely holding her head together from sinking into the puddle that the rest of her body had become. Irara was on her hands and knees shuddering as she gave a faint growl in midnight's direction. Oh, that's surprising you should all be unconscious, and yet you hear you are awake and even coherent. No doubt a side effect of taking in this boy's essence. See mother if his power can do this for them imagine what it could do for you. Iri was still grabbing Izuku's arm as she turned to her mother. Mother you can't he's going to be my husband he came here to ask for your blessing to marry me. You can't let Midnight kill him. She shouted her red mana spiking in the hall as Midnight rounded on her sister. That is enough Iri. You can't have your way all the time if this boy lives our mother will die. Do you understand what that means? For centuries mother has been holding this realm together by herself and now that we finally have a way to stop our realm from shrinking and mother from killing herself you want to throw that away for some human who probably killed our father and took his power. I will not allow that to happen. She shouted her eyes blazing as she looked at Izuku who did his best to stand his ground in the face of her bloodlust. For the first time, Izuku felt he was in real life threatening danger. Every other monster he'd met only wanted to have sex with him and keep him as theirs. But now face to face with a true demon he knew all those experiences paled in comparison. Midnight moved swiftly her pointed nails stretching out to pierce through Izuku's skull. He removed to attack Midnight her magic lancing out toward her older sister. She could not allow her to harm Izuku. If need be she would take her mother's place as demon lord. Her huge reserve of mana had to be good for something. 
Cease this at once. A booming voice shook the castle to its foundations as the entire area was blanketed in thick purple mana. None of them could withstand its pressure as midnight. Eri and Izuku were all brought to their knees. Momo, Irara, and Ashido were nowhere near resilient enough to withstand a fully realized demon lord's power and quickly fell unconscious. Nana stood there her hair flowing out around her as energy crackled between her horns and around her body like lightning in a storm cloud. I will not of my own children attacking one another in the home me and your father built together. She shouted her chest heaving as she looked at Eri and Midnight. Midnight summon all your sisters to the castle at once no objections. She said reeling in her mana and allowing the three of them to rise to their feet once more. Midnight gave a shudder before bowing low. As you wish mother. She said raising her head before turning on her heel and walking away. It wasn't until the click of her heels faded away entirely did Nana speak to Eri. Eri I want you to wait in the meeting hall until all of us are assembled. You are not to leave that hall without my permission is that understood? Eri looked up at her mother as if she was going to argue. But the glint in her mother's grey eyes told her that would be a bad idea. I understand mother. She said before taking hold of Izuku's hand. Come on Izuku let's go to the meeting hall. Before Izuku could even take a step Nana spoke once again. Izuku will be staying with me for the time being Eri. I hope you understand. She said as Eri dropped Izuku's hand. He could tell she wanted desperately to refuse her mother's command. But in the end, she was still her mother and Eri could not disobey. Very well mother, Eri said as she began to slowly walk down the hall. Now it was just him and the demon lord. Izuku kneeled down to check on Yurara and the others. They will be fine after some time has passed. I will have my servants take them to a room, she said before snapping her fingers. Heavy footsteps responded immediately as a pair of golems rounded the corner and began collecting his unconscious friends. Where are you taking them? He asked as the golems rounded the corner out of sight. He turned to look at Nana and was immediately struck by how haggard she appeared now. Moments ago she was the most powerful being he had ever seen, but now she seemed almost fragile. Nana coughed before looking at Izuku. Somewhere safe as long as you behave yourself. Izuku's heart stopped for a moment as he understood the implications of Nana's words. His friend's lives depended on his cooperation. He nodded slowly letting her know he understood. Good, now follow me I have questions and it will be some time before all my daughters arrive. Nana slowly walked back through the doors she'd exited from to stop her daughter's bickering. Izuku followed after her and found himself in a study of some sort or perhaps a library would be more apt. There was a multitude of bookcases lining the wall stretching all the way up to the ceiling and proceeding toward the back of the room. The room was dotted with plush chairs and couches along with several long solid wood tables. As a farmer, Izuku had never seen such opulence. Wow, I bet the king himself doesn't have a library as large as this. He said before hearing the soft pomp of Nana sitting on a love seat before using her magic to set a plush chair down in front of her and presenting it to Izuku. I know he doesn't, she said as Izuku sat down facing her. Nana sat there for a moment collecting her breath as she reached for a glass with a thick white liquid in it. Izuku watched her drain the glass in two swallows seeming to not even taste whatever it was. Still, she seemed to become less exhausted after drinking it. Nana set the now empty glass down as she licked her plump lips much to Izuku's delight. Excuse me I was rather parched. Now then Izuku was it. Tell me how did you come to have my husband's magic and more importantly where is he now? Izuku once again felt a shiver run through his body at those four last words. Even if he wanted to lie he wouldn't be able to under those eyes of hers. They were so familiar as well even if Izuku knew this was his first time seeing them. After taking a breath Izuku began to explain what happened and how he had come to be in the demon realm. Midnight hurriedly walked through the halls of her mother's castle. She was ashamed of having been reprimanded like a child. But she was also embarrassed about making her mother unleash her mana in such a way. Her mother was in a weakened state so that couldn't have been easy for her to do. Midnight could only imagine the stress that had put on her mother's dwindling supply of mana. She sighed as she entered a room adorned with several mirrors along the walls. Upon stepping into the exact center of the room and letting her mana flow into the markings there each of the mirrors began to glow. Midnight waited for several moments before one of the mirrors displayed a large eye taking up the entire mirror. The vertical slit held within the yellow eye narrowed as it focused on Midnight. What is it Midnight I was sleeping? A deep feminine voice rumbled out seeming to rattle the casing of the mirror it was projected from. Midnight turned to this mirror. Apologies Sister Rukiu, but Mother has requested your presence in the castle with no objections. The eye shifted out of view for a moment before a tall woman with white scales adorning her arms and legs and a pair of alabaster wings stepped into view. Is this about that boy with father's mana? She asked and Midnight nodded. Yes it is, but I hesitate to say more until we're all gathered. Mukiu rubbed her chin before nodding. I will make my way there then. She said before walking out of view and the image slowly faded to show a reflection of Midnight. Well, this is interesting. It's usually you calling us together not mother. Is everything alright? Yuobami asked from her mirror. 
Midnight turned seeing the Echid Nyuabami lounging on an assortment of pillows. It is nothing dire sister, but mother requires we all be gathered nonetheless. Yuabami looked at her older sister for a moment before sighing. As she wishes, I will be there shortly, Echidna said slithering away. As she did so a giggling could be heard from another mirror. No exceptions huh? Grandmother is getting quite needy wouldn't you say Auntie Midnight? A deep red glow emanated from the mirror the giggling was coming from. Midnight turned around to look into the mirror doing her best to hold a passive face. Well, she has been under a lot of pressure. You would know that if you bothered to show up to our gatherings. Another voice spoke before Midnight could rebuke the disrespectful voice herself. I will alert the soldiers of my absence and be there shortly sister. The rebuking voice informed Midnight before disappearing from sight. Well that was awfully rude. But fine I will appear in mother's stead on account of her being dead and all. The mocking voice said before dispelling the magic of her mirror. Cheeky little bitch. A loud voice shouted from a nearby mirror engulfed in flames. Midnight nodded. Yes, but she has kept the vampires in line for the most part so we don't have all that much to complain about. Midnight replied. I take it you will be joining us as well. Of course, if mother wills it then it shall be done without fail. I will see you soon sister. Midnight watched the glow fade from the mirror before making her own exit. With her mission accomplished, she supposed she should wait in the meeting hall until everyone arrives. Nana looked at the boy after having heard his explanation of how he came to be here and more importantly how he came to possess her husband's power. She held a hand over her eyes as she processed his tale. If this was true and she had no doubt it was. Looking into Izuku's eyes she could tell he wasn't the type to lie and if he did he wasn't good at it. Much like her Toshi he just had an honest spirit. This brings up so many questions. Why did he leave us? Where is he now? And most importantly why did he give his powers to you? What did he hope to accomplish by this? As she gave voice to each question another dozen cropped up in her mind. Was he simply tired of all this? Tired of us? She said her grey eyes falling to the stone floor. I don't think that's the reason at all. Izuku said gaining Nana's attention once more. She craned her eyes to look across the small space between them and settled on Izuku. The boy fidgeted under her gaze so unsure of himself. That wasn't like Toshi at all. Even when he was just a regular human boy he was much more confident than this boy. What would you know of his thoughts? She asked making Izuku flinch once more. I, I mean I don't know them at all. But all I can say is that he didn't seem like he was doing this to escape from something. He seemed like he had a plan or was hoping for something. Maybe it's my own perspective. Maybe I just want there to be a reason for me being here. But he did say he chose me for a reason. I don't know what that reason could be. But I just can't think that he was using me as an escape route. Izuku finally met her gaze those deep green eyes seeming to pull her in. He was her husband you probably knew him best do you think he would do something like that? Izuku asked and Nana bit her lip. No, he wouldn't that wasn't the type of man he was or would ever be. She was being foolish Toshi loved her and their children he would never abandon them. If he left them without a word and brought this boy here there had to be a good reason. Toshi had an eye for people and from the sounds of Izuku's story he had been searching for someone like him from the moment he'd left them. But for what reason could he have brought this boy here? What did you want him for Toshi? She asked herself over and over before opening her eyes and looking at the boy. Could that be it? She wondered. Toshi would never condone harming a human so he didn't send this boy here with his power as a sacrifice. But as a replacement, Nana closed her eyes and took a deep breath before opening them again. All right Toshi I'll trust you. Nana stood up from her couch causing Izuku to do the same. She was so much taller than him, but she knew that would change soon if he was anything like Toshi that is. Izuku Midoriya come with me. She said walking to the door of the library. Izuku's eyes trailed after her before the rest of his body followed suit. He didn't know where she was going, but following her was the only option. If he stepped out of line or disobeyed her Yurara and the others would suffer. I hope they're all right. He thought to himself as he followed after Nana. Ashido opened her eyes and sat up slowly her head hurt. But other than that she was all right. She slowly panned her eyes over and saw Momo and Yurara lying in similar beds near her, but there was no sign of Izuku. Slowly Ashido pulled herself together and made her way to the other two and began to wake them. Yurara, Momo wake up. She hissed to the two as they slowly came to. Both were groggy and seemed to be having the same head pains that she experienced upon waking. Where's Izuku? Yurara said sniffing the air deeply and finding no trace of her master's scent. She rolled out of bed and stumbled to her feet and made her way to the door before flinging it open and running into the solid back of a goal. She yelped as she fell to her butt on the ground rubbing her nose. Oh well, she whined. The two golems at the door turned toward them. You are to remain here per the demon lord's orders. The two spoke in monotonous unison tones. Irara growled as she stood up staring into the cold eyes of the two golems. They were much taller than her in statuesque with large breasts and wide hips. Their powerful limbs were solid stone no doubt able to crush anything with ease. The image of two brick houses came into Urara's mind as she stepped back. She wouldn't be able to overpower them. Momo came over to help her to her feet and lead her back to her bed. 
It's best to remain here for now Yurara we don't know where Izuku is or what kind of situation we might be jeopardizing by moving erratically. Yurara nodded as she sat down and flopped herself onto her side curling her tail around herself as she whined. Okay, but we barely got to see him at all before we were brought here. I miss him, she said as Momo began to rub her side. I know, but we have to be strong now. I'm sure Izuku knows what he's doing by asking to meet with the demon lord, she said as Ashido sat down next to her. Yeah, husband has this in the bag. He wouldn't abandon us, she said exuding confidence. Momo and Yurara smiled. Thank you Ashido, Momo said as the pink slime smiled. Of course, she said as Yurara sat up some. Not just for that, but also for bringing Izuku to find us. If you hadn't who knows what the Queen of Hearts would have done to us. You saved our lives. If slimes were capable of blushing Momo would say Ashido was doing so right now as she quivered like a bowl of shaken jelly. All you guys, you're welcome. I'd do anything for you guys because we all belong to Izuku right? We're partners, she said and Yurara and Momo quickly nodded all three squeezing each other in a group hug. Midnight was standing outside the meeting hall. She could tell Iri was inside and didn't wish to be in there alone with the child like Lilin. She was sure Iri could sense her outside the door just as she could sense her inside. Thankfully she soon heard the sound of approaching feet. She looked up as Ryukyu rounded the corner. The powerful dragon held her head high as she walked. Her talons clicked on the stone floor as she walked forward. Her white scales glowed in the purple moonlight along with the proud horns curving back from her forehead. Her wings were wrapped around her shoulders like a cloak as she approached. From beneath her wings, it appeared Rukyu was wearing a burgundy dress that ended just above her ankles. Sister Midnight, she said with a nod as Midnight did the same. Sister Rukyu, she said as the two embraced. Rukyu stepped back after the embrace and looked at the two large doors. Her is inside already, Rukyu stated as Midnight nodded. I thought it better I not be in there alone with her after our recent disputes. Midnight explained. Rukyu gave a low chuckle. Very well I'll be your buffer, she said as she opened the doors only for the two of them to both hear a soft scraping coming closer. The scraping sound was soon revealed to be the sound of Yuabami's multicolored scales slithering along the ground. Seeing her two older sisters Yuabami gave a small curtsy. Sisters Midnight and Rukyu, she said as her two older sisters nodded in return. Hello, Yuabami, Midnight said as Rukyu walked over to the snake woman and hugged her. Hello, little sister, Rukyu said lifting the snake woman up slightly before setting her back down. Yuobami gave a soft giggle as she was set down. Strong as always aren't you Rukyu? Yuobami said as she began to slither into the meeting hall with her two older sisters. Rukyu chuckled as she released her younger sister. Always Yuobami. A weak dragon is like a shark that isn't swimming. She replied the three sisters looked at Iri sitting sullenly in her chair as she slowly kicked her legs back and forth. In front of her was a steaming cup of cocoa and a plate of cookies and at her side was an imp minding a serving cart. Rukyu and Yuobami looked at Midnight who silently took her seat. Rukyu shrugged and called out to her baby sister. Hey Iri how have you been? She asked as she took her own seat. Iri looked up an angry glow in her eyes as they skirted to Midnight for an instant before making eye contact with Rukyu. I've been better, she said as her sharp little fangs crushed a cookie into her mouth. Rukyu smiled and nodded. Well if you want to blow off some steam I'll be happy to take you on. It's good to release pent-up frustration especially if you don't have a mate of your own to do it with. I do have one, Iri shouted looking at Rukyu and then at Midnight. Or he will be mine soon, no matter what others might say. She hissed. Midnight for her part remained stoic and did not rise to Iri's provocations. Seeing things weren't going well Yuobami interceded. If I may ask Iri what are you drinking? It smells divine, she said smiling softly as she caught Iri's attention. The younger Lilin looked at Yuobami and then her cup. It's a cup of hot cocoa with lots of marshmallows in it, she said as a small smile graced her face as she indulged in the sweet concoction once more. I can't see how you drink that sweet crap all the time. A voice rang out as the room was bathed in a warm glow. A woman stepped through the doors with flaming hair and burning green eyes. Iri looked at yet another of her older sisters. What was that mo? Iri asked as she sat up straighter in her seat. It wasn't much of a difference in height, but the glare she gave Mo was more than enough. The flaming woman's heels clicked on the stone floor as she walked around the table. She was clothed in flames across her breasts, and along her crotch, there were additional flames erupting from her wrists and ankles. There was a string of metal pearls around her neck that clacked gently with each step. Mo soon stood next to Eerie looking down at the glaring Willem. Oh I'm just playing with you Eerie. I like sweet shit too. She said ruffling Iri's hair and kissing her cheek as she snatched a cookie and sat down beside her. There was a small release of tension in the room as Iri took Mo at her word and fixed her hair. You shouldn't try to rile people up when they're already in a bad mood Mo. The owner of this voice stood in the doorway. She had purple and pink hair and stood nearly as tall as Rukyu herself. She was adorned in armor along her arms and legs and a breastplate over a deep purple dress. A great sword was sheathed at her ample hip. She walked through the meeting hall and sat next to midnight. Mo slumped forward. 
Okay, okay sorry Nagant, she said placing her chin in her palm. Nagant gave a firm nod before looking to Midnight. Elder sister, she said with a nod which Midnight returned. It is good to see you sister Nagant, she said before Nagant turned to the rest of the table. It has been a long time sisters how have all of you been? She asked to which her sisters each responded in the positive. By now only one chair remained empty. Where is that little brat? Rukiu growled staring at the empty chair as light streams of smoke emitted from her mouth. Patience Rukiu she knows the consequences of not responding to mother's summons. Midnight said as from one of the high windows the sound of shrieking bats could be heard. A cloud of bats came in through the window swirling around the empty seat before coalescing into the form of a young blonde girl with glowing red eyes and skin as pale as milk. Were you all waiting long? Himiko asked snidely as her pearly white fangs shone in the light. Mo rolled her eyes. It's about time you got here. Show some respect for your grandmother. Himiko turned to Mo smiling all the wider. Sorry, Auntie it took me a while to get ready. It's not often Grandma demands my presence. I had to feed to make such a long trip. She said licking her lips. That in itself is an issue that must be discussed Midnight said looking at the young girl. Ever since your mother passed your people have been hunting the humans relentlessly. It is raising tensions with them. Midnight explained only for Himiko to laugh. There are food. No one says anything to them when they overhunt but my people have to curb our eating habits. I think not. Himiko said crossing her arms. The young girl was dressed in a black backless dress. Her shoulders were bare as the dress cupped her modest breasts and flowed down her body like oil. Her long nails were stained red at the tip and a golden chain adorned her neck. Midnight took a breath. She was weary of confrontation. She would broach the subject with her mother once she was here and see what she would say about the vampire queen's action. As if summoned by that thought from a door near the throne her mother stepped out dressed in all her regal finery. She ascended the dais to her throne and took a seat. The room remained silent as Nana made herself comfortable. Daughters it is so good to see all of you in one room again. She said making eye contact with each one before settling on Himiko. Of course, that extends to you as well granddaughter. You look as beautiful as her mother may she rest in peace. Nana said as Himiko gave a wide smile. Thanks, Grandma. You look good too. She said as Nana chuckled. I try, but on to why I have brought you here. As you all may know recently a human boy came into our lands possessing the mana of your father who has been missing for more than a century. Many of the women there nodded. I am here to tell you that he has been found and brought before me. Nana clapped her hands and the door she entered opened again and out of it stepped Izuku. He was no longer adorned in the garb of Wonderland's Mad Hatter instead he was dressed in noble clothing. Creased black pants and freshly polished boots adorned his legs and feet. He wore a pressed white with the collar open to expose his chest in an overcoat. His hair was combed back and shiny in the light of the room. This is Izuku Midoriya and he will be the next demon lord, Nana stated. The meeting hall was silent only the sound of the flames flickering and the torches could be heard after Nana's announcement. Izuku's heart was beating a million miles a minute as he stared at the most powerful women in the demon realm. He swallowed as Midnight's chair scraped across the stone violently as she stood up. Her blue eyes locked onto Izuku before moving to her mother. What is the meaning of this? She shouted at who Nana sat there impassively unshaken by her daughter's outburst. There was a series of clapping from Mary who smiled as widely as she could. The sound of her clapping was slowly bringing the others out of their various states of shock. Iri's clapping was joined by maniacal laughter. Izuku looked at the young blonde who cupped her face as she laughed. This is insane. Himiko shouted as tears gathered in her eyes. You think this is funny? Rukiu growled as she too stood up glaring at Izuku. This was her first time seeing the boy and she was unimpressed. He had her father's mana but nothing more. He didn't have a manly face or the strength she could trust to rule her homeland. Izuku looked out at all of them as he was brought back to what happened before he entered the room. Izuku followed after Nana as the click of her heels echoed in the halls. She was striding with purpose and Izuku could see the naturally commanding presence she had. It wasn't the supreme aura he'd seen when he'd first met her, but it also wasn't the haggard look she had when they first entered the library. As he watched her he couldn't keep his eyes from wandering. Her raven black hair flowed down her back ending above her abdomen and he could see the muscles of her back shift beneath her skin and then her taut ass that still managed to have a little jiggle as she moved. He swallowed hard and licked his lips before shaking his head as she came to a stop. Nana pushed the door open and a blanket of steam wafted across their feet. The door opened into a large bathroom. The room was lightly cloaked in steam and floral smells wafted into his nose. Polished tile covered the floor in alternating colors of white and gold. The walls were smooth stone he would guess marble, but he was a stonemason so he couldn't be sure. Nana looked over her shoulder. Come in, she commanded and Izuku followed after her. Once he was inside the doors closed behind him, Izuku turned around to see a quartet of him standing behind him. They were all dressed in the same way. Short white skirts and white cloth wrapped around their chests. Izuku smiled awkwardly before looking to Nana who had taken a seat on a bench that ran the outer perimeter of the wall. 
Bathe him, she said and immediately the four imps moved to follow her command. Wait, what? Hold on. He shouted only to be overwhelmed as the four stripped him completely and led him into the bath. Izuku struggled but the four imps had a strong grip on him and once he was in the water he saw no reason to struggle anymore. Especially considering that once their white attire came into contact with the water it became translucent. Izuku stared down at the eight nipples surrounding him as he felt his body begin to be washed. Nana leaned forward watching the boy's reaction to this situation. Toshi also had a problem with this when he first came here. She didn't know why humans were so bashful, but he'd be broken of that soon enough. Now that she could see all of him she could tell he wasn't as weak as his personality seemed to broadcast. The boy's body was chiseled from his farm work and his mind had been strengthened from his time here in the demon realm. Her eyes slowly dropped down to his waist under the water. she caught a glimpse of his package while he struggled against the four imps, but she couldn't really get a good measure of him. Izuku Nana spoke capturing Izuku's attention and breaking him from the trance he had found himself in. Why yes, he shouted going completely stiff and staring at her. I need to speak with you while we have a moment and tell you what is about to happen. Izuku looked at her before nodding. Nana sat back and crossed her legs allowing the boy a small glimpse of her underwear. You have very few options now. You are in my castle and there is no escape. I mean you alone could probably escape, but I doubt you'd be able to abscond with those three women you came here with. And I can assure you they would suffer if you abandoned them to me. She said and even in the steamy water, Izuku got a chill. I would never do that. He said his voice steely. Nana nodded. I expected no less. The other option is to go through with Midnight's plan and have your essence stolen and perish in the process. Of course, we would make it as painless as possible, as well as let your little girls go free and most of all you would die as a human. Izuku swallowed at the finality of her words. If she had offered him this when he first came to the demon realm he honestly couldn't say whether or not he would have accepted that fate. He had been so terrified of turning into a monster and losing his humanity that it was entirely possible that death would have seemed preferable to living as a monster. But now, so many things had changed and most of all he had people in the demon realm he cared for. I can't do that. I don't think I could stop you if that's what you decided, but I can't simply lie down and die without fighting for my life. I have people who depend on me now. My life isn't my own anymore, he said looking into Nana's steel gray eyes. Once more the demon lord nodded. The final option and the most difficult one is for you to become the demon lord. Izuku looked at Nana with a shocked expression. But aren't you the demon lord? He asked. At this point, every inch of Izuku had been bathed and the imps stepped away alerting Nana that their task was complete. She gave a nod. Take him to get dressed. She ordered. The imps stepped out of the bath surrounding Izuku in a box as they led the naked youth to an adjoining room followed by Nana. Izuku found himself in a dressing room surrounded by opulent clothing. Most of it was women's clothing but a small portion of the space was held by men's clothing. But it was all much too big. To answer your question Izuku yes I am the interim demon lord. My husband was the true demon lord. But after his disappearance, I had to take his place. And over the last century I've done my best to hold our realm together. The confusion on Izuku's face was apparent and Nana began to explain as Izuku was dried and then dressed. The large clothing was placed upon him and then made to fit his form with magic. The demon lord isn't like one of your human kings. I don't only rule the demon realm. For all intents and purposes I am the demon realm. The realm is fed and held together by my mana. If I were to be killed and no one took my place the demon realm would begin to break down and disappear completely along with every inhabitant. Even those who escaped would not live for long without the mana of the demon realm to support them. At best they would become human at worst they would die. She explained. Izuku was amazed at just what it meant to be the demon lord. She was the only thing that stood between her people and extinction. Though I may possess it I'm not suited for the title. The demon realm has been shrinking steadily over the past century. I've tried to at least slow down the progress by eating more essence, but my husband being human once didn't want for us to needlessly hunt humans, and so I've kept to that even though it was harming me and my people. Nana sighed as she looked at Izuku. But you are a man with powerful mana. You would hold this realm together maybe even expand it with ease. And unlike me, you would be provided with more than enough sustenance to maintain your power. Izuku looked at Nana as she spelled it out for him. She wanted him to be the demon lord because if he didn't she would have no choice but to kill him and take his mana. It was for her people after all and Izuku was sure if he were in her position he would do the same. So many lives weighed on this there was no way she could allow him to leave. It would be a death sentence for the entire demon realm. Whether it came tomorrow or in another hundred years it would happen if she didn't do this. Izuku took a deep breath as he caught sight of himself in a mirror. He was fully dressed in noble garb and his fluffy hair had been styled giving him a regal look. So I ask of you Izuku what do you choose? She asked. Izuku turned to her his eyes full of resolve. I will be the demon lord. Izuku shouted to the room before him. All eyes turned to him and it took all he had not to flinch away from their gazes. 
Nana gave a small smirk. You all heard him, Nana said as she stared at her daughters. This is my decision and what I assume your father had planned as well. Midnight as well as Ryukyu still stood in defiance of this action. You can't be serious mother this boy doesn't have the strength nor does he deserve to sit on the throne. Midnight protested. Midnight's right this boy will never replace father. We should just kill him and take his mana and give it to you. Ryukyu said as she stalked towards Izuku. She was several feet taller than Izuku and standing only inches away she towered over him. Her wings flared out as smoke curled up from between her teeth. I think I'll do it now. She growled as she raised her claw. Izuku looked at the raised claw and gulped. Nana had told him that she would not intervene. If he was going to be the demon lord then he would have to prove himself to her daughters. Everything would be determined by his strength of will. The demon realm runs on one's ability to overwhelm others most of the time that sexually but sometimes violently. And being the demon lord means you dominate all. That is the role you will be taking. Izuku remembered Nana's words before she'd left him to meet her daughters. He took a deep breath. He looked into Ryukyu's golden eyes and then jumped forward. Everyone's eyes widened but none more so than Ryukyu as Izuku's lips crashed against hers. His hand wrapped around the back of her head as his other squeezed her closer to him. Izuku gave this kiss everything he had as he tried tapping into his mana. He wasn't sure how to do it, but he just let his instincts take over. Ryukyu was about to throw Izuku to the ground when she felt him take hold of her mana and pull it from her. A shudder ran through her body as pleasure flowed into her. Her claw slowed before falling to her side as her legs quaked only to give out and drop her to her knees. Now she was shorter than Izuku as he squeezed her tighter forcing heat into her body as his tongue roiled across her teeth demanding entrance. That was the last ounce of resistance she could offer, but slowly that too was being whittled away. Just before she would have permitted him entrance Izuku stopped kissing her. She panted as she opened her eyes not even realizing she had closed them. Izuku was staring down at her with swirling green eyes. He wore a powerful smirk even with a sword at the side of his neck. I think that's enough human, Nagan said from behind Izuku. He slowly turned to look at her. Release my sister I believe you've proven your point. She said stoically as Izuku smiled at her and slowly released Rukyu as he stepped away from the still panting dragoness. Nagant's purple eyes watched Izuku before sheathing her sword and helping Rukyu back to her seat before taking her own. Never once did her eyes leave Izuku. The room was quiet now even though Midnight was fuming with anger. Nana clapped her hands twice. That is enough everyone let's remain civil. Izuku please refrain from such actions for the time being and the same goes for all of you. She said looking at her daughters before coughing. Now as I said I intend to step down and have Izuku take my place as demon lord, but not immediately of course. Some of your concerns are valid. Izuku as he is now could not rule the demon realm. That is why I along with everyone here will train Izuku until he is worthy of this seat. I can maintain our realm for a bit longer. She said smiling. And Izuku has agreed to donate Mana regularly to help with that. She said before looking at the young man as he seemed to come back to his senses. Now then Izuku I'll introduce you to my daughters starting with the oldest. She said before starting. You've already met Midnight my oldest daughter she is a Lilin. Izuku turned to Midnight who refused to even look in his direction only staring up at Nana. Next is Nagant a dark Valkyrie. Izuku nodded in the direction of the swordswoman who'd stopped him earlier. Nagant was civil enough to return his nod. And you've recently gotten to know Rukyu the dragon. She said pointing out the dragoness who seemed to be returning to her senses as her eyes skirted in his direction before looking away again only to repeat the process. Then you have Yuobami who is an Echidna. Izuku looked over toward the large snake woman who bowed her head warily. Yuobami wasn't sure what to think of this situation, but for now, she'd follow her mother's lead. Izuku nodded in return. She seemed nice enough or at the very least she wasn't outwardly hostile, but that came with its own pitfalls he was sure. Then there is Mo who is an Efreeti. Izuku moved his eyes to the woman who seemed to be made of fire. Her flames were crackling fiercely as she stared at him. She made no move to acknowledge him only staring at him her burning gaze searing into him as they locked eyes. He took a shallow breath as he nodded in her direction. And then you know Uri my youngest daughter. She is also a Lilim, but a rare breed known as an Alice. Uri smiled and fluttered her fingers at Izuku in greeting. Izuku couldn't help but return the smile as he nodded in her direction. He knew that Iri might be the most powerful woman at this table, but he couldn't deny how nice it was to have someone actually happy to see him in this den of ferocious women. And finally though she is not my daughter she is of my blood, my granddaughter Himiko the vampire. At the word vampire Izuku's mouth went dry. To be honest, he hadn't heard of many of the monster types Nana had introduced, but he couldn't name one person who hadn't heard of a vampire, a bloodthirsty monster that drained their victims of their life and could charm a man in an instant with just a look. Izuku turned and found a pair of glowing red eyes taking up his entire vision. A pair of ice-cold hands cupped his face as he stared into those red eyes. He heard a soft giggle as Himiko pulled back. Well, well, well you are an interesting one. You're gonna be the new demon lord. I think that's crazy. She shouted as Izuku realized she was floating to meet his height. But I like it. 
she said as a long tongue slipped out of her mouth to caress his cheek. Izuku did his best not to flinch and hold his strength. There was a low rumble from the other side of the room where he sat. Himiko's smile grew wider before she floated away. Whoops sorry auntie didn't mean to upset you, Himiko said as she sat back in her seat. Now that their introductions were over midnight stood up to speak. Mother I simply can't support this. I do not wish to disrespect you or go against your wishes, but I can't accept this. He is but a boy and has no control over his abilities, nor does he possess the temperament of a demon lord. You want us to entrust our realm to this boy. I say no and I ask that you allow a vote amongst us sisters on how to proceed. If the majority agrees with you then we shall do as you say and prepare this boy as the next demon lord. But if we disagree I would ask you to allow us to handle this our way. At this, Izuku began to sweat. He thought that Nana was the highest authority and her daughters would simply follow her orders, but it seemed that wasn't entirely true. Nana stared at midnight for a moment as she thought. It would be cruel to have asked Izuku to take the throne only to put his life in her daughter's hands. It was practically a death sentence. She could already tell how Midnight would vote as well as Iri. So she knew at least Iri would side with her. The others were a toss-up. Nana sighed if she didn't give her daughters a choice in this she would be no better than a tyrant. She'd made her daughters walk the same path as her out of respect for Toshi even when it was detrimental to her. She couldn't do that again. Very well Midnight if the vote does not go my way I will allow you and your sisters to decide how things go for Izuku. But if you are going to kill him allow his lovers to say goodbye and then release them with no harm done to them. That's the least we can do. Midnight nodded at that. Of course mother I will see that those three are sent back home unharmed. And his death will be painless. Thank you for indulging me. Midnight said as she bowed deeply. Once she rose she turned to her sisters. I vote that we should take the boy's mana and give it to mother. This will result in his death of course. Midnight said this so clinically Izuku felt his stomach drop. She really didn't care about his life at all. She truly was a demon. Even so, he couldn't hate her for it. She thought she was doing what was best for her people and her realm. It wasn't like she was wrong. He was a farmer's son it was a blessing he could read and write, but ruling a kingdom. If he was on the outside looking and even he wouldn't think he was capable of it. I agree with Big Sis Midnight. This boy is untested and lacks the aura of a ruler. It's a shame he has to die, but that power should be in the hands of someone who knows how to use it. Mo said from her seat. I disagree. Izuku is a good guy and would be a great demon lord even mother thinks so. Doesn't that count for anything? The room stalled at Eri's question. This was something their mother had decided that was not a fact easily overlooked. At this point, Yuobami spoke up. Eri does have a point this is not just an appraisal of Izuku's skills, but also a test of how much we trust mother's judgment. On that merit alone I side with mother. Midnight looked at Yuobami but said nothing. She couldn't fault her sister for her choice. What she said was true this was her mother's plan a plan their father apparently had put in motion. But even so Midnight could not accept this. She had to push forward even if it meant defying her parents' wishes. She was sure he thought she was simply being cruel to get back at her, but that was not the case. Midnight had always followed her mother's wishes on not killing humans, but this was no longer such an easy thing to do. This boy's life would be the key to their salvation. He has a powerful mana, Ryukyu said as she finally looked up. I don't think he's suited for the throne, but that power would be wasted if we killed him. Perhaps if mother kept him as a concubine and fed off him. He's only a few more instances away from becoming an incubus and once that happens he'll be overflowing with mana. Enough that regular feedings will sustain mother and allow the boy to live. She said not looking in Izuku's direction. There was a silence in the room after her proposal. Admittedly Midnight did not think of that. She was so preoccupied with empowering her mother as soon as possible that she neglected such a thought. I don't know, I like the thought of that boy on the throne. It'll be fun and no offense Granny Nana, but it's been a while coming now. You've been the demon lord long enough. We all know a man should sit on that throne. I like the weakness he has it makes him look cute I want to see what happens when he gets a taste of real power. Will he change? Grow drunk with lust and power taking each of us to his bed and then ravenously feeding upon human women as well. That's a sight I want to see. What do you think Izuku? Would you like to take us to bed? Forcefully if we resist. Overwhelm and dominate us until we can only do what you want. Himiko asked trailing a red tip nail down her chest. This was the first time Izuku had been addressed since the discussion began. To think it would be such a blatant and lustful question. He swallowed and bit his lip as his eyes moved around the room of their own accord. Whether he wanted to or not images of each of these beautiful women in his bed did flash through his mind. See he does have the makings of a demon lord. Even in this situation where his life is on the line at the mere mention of carnal acts, he's overflowing with lust. I know all of you can practically taste it. Himeko said with a mischievous grin. As much as they didn't want to admit it the sisters at the table had to agree. They could see and nearly taste Izuku's lust for them. Well, I suppose that makes me the tiebreaker then, Nagant said coolly as her purple eyes landed on Izuku locking him into a staring contest. 
Himeko makes a decent point. The boy has the lust of a demon lord which some would say is all he should need to hold the throne, but the rest of you have also made good points. He may have the desire but lacks the ambition to make any of those desires a reality. Then again he is quite young and has not fully awakened to his incubus nature. Nagant grew quiet for a moment before speaking again. I believe there is merit to what Ryukyu said. Mother wishes for Izuku to be the next demon lord, but he clearly lacks the power and mental fortitude for the role. That is where we will come in. I say we put Izuku to the test. Until next year Izuku will have to seduce each of us if he is able to sleep with all of us by the end of the year then we will accept Izuku as demon lord serving alongside mother until such a time she is willing to relinquish the throne to him fully. Midnight's eyes had grown wider with each word Nagant said. She had never thought that Nagant would disagree with her. There was no one more loyal or straightforward than her. And with the two of them being the oldest sisters they always had a close bond, so this was truly unexpected. Well, then I would say that things have been decided. Four agree that Izuku should become the next demon lord after a trial and I agree. Izuku will pursue each of you for the next year and should he prove successful he will ascend to the throne and one of you will be his wife and rule beside him. At these words, several of her daughters looked at her shocked. You can't be serious mother. Midnight shouted as Nana giggled like a naughty schoolgirl. Oh, but I am Midnight after all it's what happened when your father defeated my father. He took me as his wife and it's a tradition I have always wanted to continue. She said standing up. Now that these things have been decided I think we should immediately move on to deciding who Izuku's first pursuit will be. She said as she summoned a box and a piece of paper. With a flick of her wrist, the paper was cut into seven equal pieces after which one strip was turned a brilliant green. All seven strips were deposited into the box. Now each of you come forward and take a single strip from this box. Whoever draws the one that is as green as Izuku's hair will be the lucky one to have him pursue her. There were several grimaces amongst her children but also two wide smiles. Iri practically threw herself out of her chair in a rush to get to the box first. But she was seconds too slow as Himiko's slender pale hand dove into the box and began rustling around the pieces of paper. She drew back her fist after selecting her strip. She didn't even bother to hide it as she opened her hand and stared down at the snow-white piece of paper in her hand. She grits her teeth in a furious state. Izuku looked out the corner of his eye at the snarling rictus Himiko was making until she noticed him looking and erased the anger from her face in an instant before smiling cutely at him. Sorry Izuku and I goofed, she said before fluttering back to her chair. Izuku gave an apologetic smile before turning to Iri. She had her fingers crossed as she reached into the box and rustled around for several seconds before pulling out a strip. Iri looked at her closed fist before slowly opening it as if that would give her a better chance of having the green strip she so desired. It was not to be though as Iri stared down at a white strip of paper. Her cherry red eyes widened before her cute little mouth turned into a frown as she drove her small foot into the stone floor sending deep cracks into the stone. None aside, Iri dear I know you're disappointed, but that was not very ladylike like please stop and go take your seat, she said. Iri stomped off to her seat and pouted. Well come on the rest of you we don't have all day, Nana said as the rest of her daughters approached the box and took a strip of paper. Now after the first person to draw the green strip we will proceed in order of who came to the box first. She said now that the green strip had been chosen. Nana's eyes traveled to her lucky daughter and smiled. Congratulations, she said with a smile. Izuku was being led through the halls after the meeting with Nana and her daughters. He still couldn't quite believe what had happened in there. He was sure he'd be dead by now. It was clear Midnight did not like him and some of her sisters were of the same mind. But apparently, to others their mother's words counted for a lot. He was grateful for that, but now he was all in. If he couldn't get all of them to sleep with him then he'd be killed or at best kept as a pet used to supply Nana for the rest of his day. He sighed as he stared at the back of the imp that was leading him to see Urara, Momo, and Ashido. As he did so he thought it would be a good idea to practice his seduction. Not that he had any idea on how to seduce a woman, but his life hung in the balance. He swallowed and took a deep breath. Excuse me, he said and immediately cursed himself for stuttering. The imp seemed to be just as startled as him as she squeaked and turned to face him. Why yes Izuku-sama, H how can I be of service to you? She said stuttering much like Izuku was and immediately Izuku deflated. He couldn't do what he'd planned on doing, but he had called out to her so he had to say something. As sorry for startling you I just wanted to ask if something like this has ever happened before. He asked making up some random question as the two began to walk again. The imp released a breath as she spoke. There have been humans in these halls before, but you would be the first one I've seen in my service to Nana-sama. She said as Izuku rubbed the back of his head. So you didn't know the former demon lord? He asked as once again the imp shook her head. No, I didn't that was before I began my service. Sorry I couldn't be of more service Izuku-sama. She said as she turned and bowed to him. Izuku looked at her bowed over and he reached out to pet her head right between her tiny horns. That's all right. He said, thank you for answering my questions, he said before pulling his hand back. 
The imp stood up straight her face bright red as she looked at the two golems down the hall and bit her lip. Thank you Izuku-sama. Your companions are behind the door where those two golems are. I hope to be of service to you again and dot 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 good luck. She said before flying off down the hall. Izuku looked after her until she rounded a corner out of his sight. He took a deep breath before walking toward the two golems. At his presence, they stepped aside permitting him entry to the room. Izuku opened the door and saw Momo, Yurara, and Ashido all asleep in the same bed. He walked into the room and quietly shut the door before moving over to them. He stood at the side of the bed looking down at their sleeping faces. They must be exhausted after all this time. It had only been a week since he got here he thought, but it felt so much longer than that. As he looked down at them he felt that familiar urge in his stomach and his member beginning to throb with desire. He stared at their faces as he let his lust build within him. If he was to seduce the demon lord's daughters he had to get used to this ever-present feeling of lust. He couldn't keep forcing it down he had to come to grips with it. As he let the lust build he noticed a green mist leaking from his mouth and flowing down to the three women. He watched as they inhaled it in their sleep and immediately their faces became flushed and they started to shift in their sleep. Izuku watched in fascination as they began to writhe and moan. He could only imagine what they were dreaming about at least until Momo spoke. Izuku. She moaned before her eyes popped open and she shot up breathing heavily and clutching her chest. A light sheen of sweat had built up on her forehead and he could see the peaks of her nipples pushing against her shirt. Izuku reached out and placed his hand on Momo's shoulder. She twitched before turning to Izuku and smiling widely. I see you K.U. She shouted and took hold of his hand pressing it to her face and kissing across his palm. Her shout and heated kissing awoke the other two who also launched themselves at Izuku. Irara wrapped herself around his midsection squeezing him tightly as she nuzzled into his abs. Ashido slithered between the two to cling to his back and kiss his cheek repeatedly. You're okay. Irara shouted looking up at him with tears building in the corners of her eyes that threatened to spill into her honey brown fur. I'm so glad husband we were so worried. Ashido shouted between kisses. Momo looked at him and smiled gently. Welcome back. She whispered against his palm still cupping her face with his hand. Izuku was nearly brought to tears as he looked at the trio of women. If he wasn't sure before about whether these three truly cared about him or were just lusting after him he was definitely sure now that they loved him. And he now knew how he felt and what he had to do. I'm back in Momo, Yurara, Ashido. I love you all of you. He said and once more a spark of green energy traveled from Izuku into the three of them sending a sheen of green mana across their eyes as the three of them moaned and looked at Izuku their eyes dark with affection. I love you too Izuku, Momo whispered before sucking on the pad of his thumb. I love you too master, Yurara said as she pulled his shirt up kissed his stomach and inhaled his clean scent. Even over the smell of the luxurious soaps he'd been bathed and she could still smell his scent and she loved it. Yes, husband I love you too, Ashido said as she kissed his cheek and then moved down to his neck. Izuku gave a low growl as he felt pleasure run through his body. His hand moved to the top of Yurara's head and gently began to guide her lower before shaking his head. Wait, you guys there are some things I have to tell you first. I want you all to know what's about to happen and what the demon lord wants from me. He said as he sat down on the bed across from them. Momo reluctantly let his thumb slip from her mouth and Yurara who had her hands on his pants knowing what Izuku wanted from her released the hem of his pants. Ashido pouted as she slipped from his shoulder to sit next to Momo on the other bed the three of them looked at Izuku. The young man took a deep breath before going into detail about what had transpired after they left his side. Nana returned to her room after all the commotion of today. She actually gave a yawn. It was almost funny she couldn't remember the last time she'd felt this tired. Sure ever since becoming the demon lord she always had a fog of exhaustion on her but today had really drained her. She was actually looking forward to sleeping right now. As she neared her room she felt a presence and stifled a sigh. Yes Nagant. She asked as she turned to face her second oldest daughter. Nagant stood before her straight as an arrow and her eyes staring straight at her unwavering. Her daughter had always been a taciturn woman. Sometimes Nana found it hard to read her, but Nagant always said what she meant and meant what she said. There was no beating around the bush with her and as she would come to find out this conversation would be no different. Are you sure this is the best course of action mother? Nagant asked point blank and Nana opened her bedroom door and stepped inside. She gave a wave of her hand ushering her daughter in after her. Nana took a seat on a plush chair as she eyed her daughter waiting for her to take a seat before speaking. Nagant stepped into the room and shut the bedroom door before taking a seat in the other chair. To answer your question yes I do Nagant. Your father chose him for a reason and I will always trust what your father does. Nagant stared at her mother before sitting forward. There's no way he could be lying. You're sure this isn't some trick of the humans? Nagant continued with her questions. Nana could see why she'd waited until it was just the two of them to ask these questions. Nagant was loyal to a fault she wouldn't want to be seen as disrespecting her mother or questioning her so much in front of the others. She smiled at her daughter and leaned forward. You've always been a good girl Nagant. You always followed the rules and for that I thank you. 
Though I don't think he's lying. I don't think he's capable of telling one to this degree. You saw him it's not in his nature. Much like your father when he was young he was awful at telling lies. Nana said with a giggle. Thinking of Toshi trying to lie always made her laugh. As far as this being some plot by the human world I can't rule it out. But I would like to think that if they did do something like this they'd have chosen a more capable person, an adult man at the very least. Nagant had to concede to her mother's logic. If she were orchestrating the type of plan that she thought the humans might be implementing she would not have chosen someone like Izuku for this. Not a child that at least to her knowledge knew very little about the demon realm. Very well my last question then mother. Is my sister in danger while being alone with him? Nagant asked and Nana smiled. So protective of your little sister you really are a good girl Nagant. No, I don't think Izuku poses a danger to any of us as of yet. He hasn't awakened to his powers yet and I just don't think with his personality he'd be willing to harm us unless pushed to that limit which I doubt will come to pass. Once again Nagant had to acknowledge her mother was right. Izuku was not confrontational and her sisters would not outright attack him unless their lives were in danger and considering the little threat Izuku possessed that was highly unlikely. Nagant stood up and gave a small bow. Now that her worries had been assuaged she felt it was best to leave. Thank you for indulging my questions mother and even more so for relieving my fears. She said as she rose from her bow. Nana simply smiled at her second oldest child. Of course Nagant I'm your mother taking away your fears will always be my job. She said as Nagant gave the ghost of a smile before leaving her mother's chambers. Momo's jaw was hanging after hearing what Izuku had told her. Seriously, that's what happened. Momo asked as she swallowed. Even the simple Mina could understand that something drastic had happened. They're going to be the demon lord husband. The pink slime asked as Izuku shook his head. Only if I manage to seduce all the current demon lord's daughters and some of them aren't my biggest admirers at the moment. Momo scoffed at his words. That's an understatement it's clear Midnight wants you dead and after the stunt you pulled I can only assume Ryukyu isn't happy with you either. This is a tall order for anyone Izuku. Needless to say it will not be easy. Izuku nodded in agreement even now he wasn't sure he could do it. I don't have a choice Momo I don't want to die and I don't want to leave you all behind. At those words Urara leapt up. We'll help you master. She shouted before jumping into his lap. We'll all go with you and make sure you succeed. Momo gave a small smile. She had thought that Urara would be reluctant to allow this to go through. She wasn't the jealous type, but she didn't like not being close to Izuku. Between the three of them she was the most affectionate. She didn't mind sharing Izuku with Ashido and herself, but to add any more women and such powerful ones at that, Momo thought Urara would not allow it but it seems she underestimated the cobble. Urara could see the situation they were in and made her choice. Urara is right we will ask to accompany you on your mission and give you all the help we can. But before that you need training. Momo said as she sat beside Izuku. You need to feed for one and doing so will help you control and get used to the growing lust inside you. Once you know how your mana flows in your aroused state you'll become more comfortable with it. Momo began to slide her top down making Izuku blush. Are right now. He shouted as Momo looked at him. It has to be now you'll be heading out tomorrow right. You need a clear mind and a full stomach. Izuku opened his mouth to dispute that but couldn't. She was right of course. Izuku needed to be in top form when he started this so with a heavy sigh he nodded. Okay let's do this. He said as Momo smiled before looking at the other two. Well don't just sit there we're all going to help after all. Izuku needs to get used to various female forms. The demon lord's daughters don't all look human. Urara's tail was wagging fiercely as she flopped her back onto the bed holding her arms wide and spreading her legs. Out of the three she was the only one who really didn't wear clothes. Her fur served to conceal her modesty. Do whatever you want master I don't mind. She panted eagerly. Ashido bounced over to the bed as well leaving herself open to Izuku's touch. Don't forget about me husband. Izuku looked at the two girls lying on the bed and felt his face heat up. But took a deep breath and fought through his hesitancy. If he couldn't even make three women who already professed their love for him feel good there was no way he'd be able to seduce Nana's daughters. He reached forward and grabbed hold of Ashido's breasts. He heard a light squeak as his hand made contact with her skin. It seemed like Ashido had a thin membrane surrounding her entirely liquid body. She was cool to the touch and smooth there was almost no resistance as his hand moved around her breasts. Ashido squirmed under his touch and whined when he took her nipple between his fingers. The little nub was much firmer than the rest of her skin as he rolled it between his fingers. Izuku watched Ashido's face as the pleasure roiled through her. Her breathing increased punctuated by sharp intakes and moans. He moved forward and captured her lips after her latest gasp. He felt her cool lips against his as he probed her mouth with his tongue. He tasted her truly tasting all of her since her entire body was composed of the same liquid. Ashido moaned into his mouth as Izuku plundered her mouth for all she was worth and the heat expanded through her body made her feel as if she was boiling. Her hand wrapped around Izuku's back as she slipped her other under his shirt and felt his firm muscular chest. Her liquid body even picked up the vibrations of his heart. 
Each beat sent a ripple through her body. Izuku pulled back to catch his breath and looked to the side to see an absolutely adorable pair of puppy dog eyes begging him for attention. He looked down at Yurara and chuckled as his move to scratch her belly. There was a gentle whine as her leg kicked erratically. The belly rub was only the beginning as Izuku's hand moved down to Yurara's pussy. She yipped happily as she felt Izuku's fingers slide between her lower lips. Her fur was already dark with her arousal Izuku could smell her desire, but not just hers. He could smell Ashido's and Momo's each scent was unique and intoxicating. Momo moved behind Izuku from where she'd been sitting on the other bed and began to undress him. Izuku was thankful for the help and tried to help her as much as he could with both his hands occupied. He leaned down to kiss Yurara as he shifted to let Momo get his pants off and free his cock. Once his cock was out in the open all three women were buffeted by Izuku's powerful musk. Momo bit her lip as the waves of Izuku's lust brushed across her body lighting a flame under her skin. She pressed her nude body against Izuku's back just to feel the source of the fire in her skin. Ashido having seen Izuku's cock, but never experienced it was eager to try it desperate even. Ashido slipped under Izuku gripping his hard and so very hot cock. She felt Izuku thrust into her grip as if it were her pussy. She smiled glad to see he was as eager as she was. Ashido guided his member into her and gasped as she finally got to relish in the feeling of Izuku inside her. This had been on her mind since well she got her mind. It was all thanks to Izuku's pulse of mana that she gained a higher level of consciousness. Izuku spread her open as his cock pushed inside her. Oh husband, she moaned once she had all of him inside her. Izuku had turned his head to kiss Momo as he fingered Yurara who was panting heavily under his touch. Izuku broke the kiss with Momo to hiss and look at Ashido as he felt her pussy engulf his cock. Ashido thrust herself against Izuku driving him deep into her. Izuku was mesmerized by the sight of his cock driving into Ashido being able to see his dick through her translucent skin was so obscene it only made him harder. He grabbed hold of Ashido's waist with one hand and gave a savage thrust into her. The slime girl gave a deep moan as Izuku sent ripples throughout her body making her very mind shake with pleasure. The sheets grew moist as Ashido barely held her form together under the pleasure Izuku was giving her. Irara turned her head looking into Ashido's cock-drunk eyes and began licking the girl's face tasting the arousal on her. Izuku began a hard rhythm of fucking Ashido her body jiggling with each impact as she moaned uselessly. Momo moved from behind Izuku giving him more room to drive back and deliver powerful thrusts into Ashido. She sat on the opposite side of Ishido and played with the slime's tits as she played with her own pussy which was absolutely drenched at this point. Being able to watch Izuku fuck someone was almost as arousing as having sex with him herself. She watched his eyes glow green as his pace increased reducing Ashido to a quivering mess before he pushed as deep into her as he could and came. Momo watched the cloud of semen erupt from his cock inside Ishido. Her mouth was watering as she watched the obscene amount of cum fill Ishido who quivered as each shot of cum entered her. Her body was barely in its human form as her eyes moved lazily and her head trying to focus on Izuku as he continued to fill her with his seat. Her body being mostly liquid Izuku's semen traveled throughout her instantly, but she had a feeling that if she had a less malleable form her belly would be swollen with seat. Izuku slowly pulled his cock out it was drenched in a mixture of Ashido and his own seat. Allow me Izuku, Momo said as she leaned down and enveloped Izuku's cock in her mouth. The boy gave a growl as Momo's tongue swirled around the tip of his sensitive cock. His fingers moved erratically as Momo stimulated his cock. Yurara moaned as Izuku's fingers went back to work inside her bringing her to climax almost instantly. Her pussy squirted around his digits darkening her fur and drenching the blankets of the bed even more. Momo slowly pulled off Izuku's cock having gotten a taste of him but before she could get too far away Izuku grabbed her by her hair and forced her back onto his dick which was once again hard. Her grey eyes looked up at Izuku who was smirking down at her with a lustful grin that made her pussy clench in anticipation. She resumed her ministrations as she sucked Izuku's dick. He thrust against her face slapping his balls against her chin as drool ran down her mouth. Her eyes watered as her pussy dribbled its juices down her legs. She was sure she couldn't breathe, but she didn't care and soon her efforts were rewarded as Izuku came filling her mouth with an explosion of cum so fearsome shot from her nose as her cheeks filled with his cum. She swallowed as fast as she could, but barely kept up with the torrent of jizz. Soon enough the geyser of seed came to a stop and Momo was allowed to breathe again as Izuku pulled his cock free of her mouth. She stayed there on her hands and knees panting before falling to her side licking her face trying to claim every drop of cum that had escaped her before. Izuku himself was covered in a thin sheen of sweat and breathing heavily. He hadn't known how much he'd needed this, how much he needed them. If they were by his side he could definitely do what he had to in order to keep them safe. Izuku moved each of the now exhausted girls to the bed next to the one they'd made such a mess of and had them all under the covers as he slipped in next to them. Now that he was fed he needed sleep. Tomorrow he'd be facing the first of many challenges to secure a life for himself and these girls. Demon Lord Shigaraki I the hero Tashinori Yagi have come to defeat you. 
A powerfully built blonde man shouted this after having kicked open the door to the throne room of the demon lord. A dark laughter emanated from throne as a tall man with white hair and black horns stood up. The creature standing in front of the throne was a demon in all respects from the jet black horns to the powerful blood red wings that flared from his back shredding the cloak he'd been wearing. His eyes were a deep red as if they were filled with blood. Fangs protruded from his mouth as he smiled and raised one clawed hand. You're a fool to come here human. I will kill you and parade your body through the human world as I conquer it. Now die. Demon Lord Shigaraki launched himself at the blonde hero in a powerful clash. Tashinori raised his sword and shield and yelled his battle cry. Plus Ultra. As the smoke cleared after the battle Tashinori approached a young woman with black hair. She was on her knees over her father's dead body. Are you going to kill me too? The girl asked him. He stumbled in his weakened state and broken armor. I don't kill unless I have to. I'm sorry I had to kill him, but it was the only way. Toshi said knowing his words would be of no comfort to a child who'd just lost her father. The girl shook her head her black hair moving back and forth. Don't apologize. My father was a monster above all else. He didn't care for anyone but himself, not even me. But for the people of this kingdom I will have to take on the title of Demon Lord. She said as she stood and faced Toshi. You are in the presence of future Demon Lord Nana Shimura. She shouted in his face. The blonde hero looked at her and then laughed a great and powerful laugh that shocked and irritated Nana. What are you laughing at? She shouted as Toshi curbed his laughter. I'm sorry, so sorry, but you just looked so cute right then. Nana blushed at being called cute. You know I don't have any family back in my world and now that I accomplished my mission I doubt they would have much use for me there. How about I stay here? He said with the biggest and most genuine smile she'd ever seen as he held out his hand to her. I'm Tashinori Yagi nice to meet you demon lord Nana Shimura. Nana's eyes opened as she felt them gather with tears. She wiped them away as she sat up. You were always such a weirdo. She said shaking her head as she got out of bed and got dressed. She always dreamed about Toshi, but this is the first time in a while that she dreamt about that moment. Her father had upset the balance too much and the gods had decided to step in, indirectly of course. They blessed someone as the new hero and that hero was Tashinori Yagi. If someone had told her that she would grow to not only love, but marry a human hero way back then she would have laughed in their face. She sighed as she stepped out of her room and was immediately attended by a pair of imps as she walked down the halls. When she was younger she found the act of walking the halls so mundane and took to teleporting wherever she wanted to go. But after meeting Toshi and walking beside him because he refused to be teleported by her she found the charm in just taking things one step at a time. After his disappearance and her needing to conserve as much mana as possible she was thankful for her tolerance of walking the halls. If she had taken to teleporting even after meeting Toshi she would be exhausted after having walked through the castle. She made her way to the dining room for a quick breakfast, since most of her mana was being used to support the demon realm and she refused to take in copious amounts of essence she supplemented her diet with actual food. Before her was set a plate of berries drizzled in honey. Nana picked up a strawberry watching a line of sticky gold form as she pulled the fruit away from its brethren before snapping as it drooped under its own weight. She bit into the fresh fruit feeling the splash of honey across her tongue followed by the tart sweetness of the strawberry. As she ate more thoughts of her husband flowed through her mind. Unlike Izuku who was born a commoner in the human world Toshi was a noble. His father had been a knight and his younger brother was an archivist. But Toshi was the hero. He didn't ask for it. In fact until that point Toshi had been a frail and sickly boy. But after the gods blessed him with the title of hero and all the power that came with it he was a paragon of masculinity. Nana licked the honey off a blueberry as she remembered Toshi's form. He was tall much taller than her and rippling with muscle a tower of strength, and yet so gentle when he held her. His lips ghosting across her flesh as those big hands caressed her body. Nana bit her finger realizing her plate was empty, and that she was simply fantasizing about Toshi. She shook her head and composed herself. As she brought herself under control she stood up leaving the table to be cleaned by the kitchen staff. It was nearly time. Nana once more began walking through the castle until she arrived at the foyer and saw Izuku and his three companions already gathered. Nana slowed down and watched them from a distance for a moment. Izuku was no Toshi that was abundantly clear, but he had his own charms. That youthful face of his brought out a motherly affection in her and a hunger to dominate him. She could imagine those green eyes looking up at her tinged with lust and trepidation. She bit her lip to stop that train of thought. She was far more lustful than usual. She might have to absorb some essence to take the edge off. She stepped forward making her presence known. Immediately the kobold, witch, and slime kneeled to her. Izuku quickly followed suit. You may rise. She said watching them do as she said. Today starts your trial Izuku. If you manage to seduce my daughters and prove yourself worthy to them you will inherit the title of demon lord. Izuku gave a hard swallow before nodding. If you fail though you will become my concubine and I will send your lovers away. Your essence will only be for me. Once more Izuku nodded. 
Now then where is your first conquest? She asked the open room before a soft scraping could be heard and from the side appeared Yuobami. I would appreciate it if you wouldn't call me a conquest mother. Yuobami said as she moved toward the rune at the side of the room that began to glow with her magic. Of course sorry Yuobami. Izuku are you ready? Nana asked. The boy looked up at Nana with eyes full of intent. Would it be alright if my companions came with me your majesty? They are a part of me and I would like to have them at my side during these challenges. Nana paused for a moment as if in thought before nodding. I will allow it. That won't be a problem will it Yuobami? She asked the Echidna who sighed and shrugged. I don't see why not. He will not be feeding from me so it should only be right he has a store of food. She said referring to the three girls as Izuku's food store and nothing more. Nana frowned but said nothing. Very well if you four would stand on the sigil next to Yuobami who scooted away keeping her distance from Izuku and his troop. Have a safe trip. Nana said as Yuobami activated the teleportation sigil and sent them to her home. Izuku had several encounters with teleportation, but this was probably the most comfortable of them all. It was simple he stood on the glyph blinked and he was somewhere else. The place was extremely humid Izuku almost felt like he was drinking the air with every breath he took. He looked around and caught a glimpse of the outside world through a window. They had arrived in a jungle it seemed. Izuku recognized the scenery from one of the books his father had sent him. Welcome to my lands the Araburo's jungle. Yuobami said as she began to slither off. Izuku and company walked behind her and Izuku became mesmerized by her undulating body. Her snake-like body weaving back and forth in front of him was nearly hypnotic. They moved from what seemed to be a courtyard into the castle proper. Momo looked around and noticed the overgrown walls and cracked stone. Is this a ruin? She asked noticing the weathered D stones. Iwabami spoke without looking back. Yes it was. It was an ancient castle once held by human royalty until my grandfather expanded the demon realm into this area long ago. After my mother became the new demon lord and my sisters and I needed control the far-flung corners of her domain I found this castle and made it my own. While me and my pets. As if on cue there was a monotony of hisses. The quartet all looked up seeing snakes hanging from the ceiling and slithering out of the cracks in the stone. But the most frightening snake came around the corner. It was absolutely massive in length. Its head was up to Yuobami's waist and its body extended past the length of the corridor. Ah there you are Jormungandr. Yuobami said rubbing the snake's head as his tongue flickered happily. Izuku swallowed hard staring at the massive serpent. He'd killed a few snakes on his farm back home, but he'd need more than a hoe to slay this beast. Come over and introduce yourself. Yuobami commanded as her golden eyes stared at Izuku who locked eyes with her fearfully. WWH what? She smiled happily at the stuttering boy. You're going to be the next demon lord right? You can't tell me little Jormi scares you. She said drawing her nail up and down the snake's head. Izuku once more swallowed as he looked to the snake and staring into his vertical pupils as he slowly stepped forward. Be careful master. Irara cautioned as Izuku slowly walked up to the large reptile that slowly lifted his head so he could stare Izuku in the eye. Not that he had that far to go. Jormungandr's head was up to Izuku's chest. Izuku took a deep breath and reached out for the snake. He held his hand inches before actually making contact with his nose. He remembered his mother telling him how to approach animals he wasn't familiar with and wanted to pet. Hold his hand out 90% of the way and come from below and hold letting the animal make the decision whether it wanted to be petted. Yuobami cocked her head to the side with interest. It seemed the boy had some decorum at least. Jormungandr stared at Izuku for several seconds before flicking his tongue against Izuku's palm before pressing his nose against it. Izuku jumped a little at the cold scales brushing against his palm but then relaxed and began to stroke the giant snake's head. Hello Jormungandr, Izuku said as the snake pulled away apparently having enough physical contact for the moment and began to slither down the hall. You all should not leave your room after nightfall. Jormungandr and my other children become more active at night and are very hungry. I suggest you get used to being here for the next year at most. I have no desire to sleep with you Izuku nor do you have any way of changing my mind. You might as well give up now and accept your place as mother's concubine. I'm sure she'll treat you well, and you'll live in the lap of luxury. Yuobami tried to show him how futile this all was and get him to accept what his future held for him. If that's how you felt then why did you side with Nana? He asked looking at her. You didn't want me to die and I thank you for that. This may be trial, but I also want to show my gratitude to you any way I can. He said taking a small step forward. He was closer than she would like but not so close she felt a need to call it out. Thank you Yuobami, for your mercy then and your consideration now. You truly are very kind and I want to vindicate your kindness by succeeding this trial. I know you don't have any hope that I can overcome this, but I have to at least try. He said with a confident smile. Yuobami flicked her snake-like tongue in the air as she looked at him. This wasn't the small boy who had stood in front of her and her sisters barely keeping a facade of strength and confidence. He truly believed every word he said and it made her curious as to where this confidence came from. If you say so, but for now I'll show you to your room. 
I assume sharing one between the four of you won't be a problem. Of course not thank you for being so understanding. Izuku said as he followed after the Empress of Snakes as she led them to a large room. There was one massive bed at the back of the room. The ceiling was covered in blooming vines and a long carpet stretched the width of the room. There's also a bathroom through there. She said giving a nod in the direction of another door. Oh that's wonderful. Momo said stepping forward while pulling Urara and Ashido. I hate to say it has been a while since our last bath. Izuku why don't you take a tour with Mistress Uobami while the three of us freshen up. Momo suggested and Izuku gave a nod. Sounds like a plan if you're willing. He said looking at Uobami who flicked her tongue once again. Izuku was starting to learn that. That action meant she was thinking about something. He would liken it to a human stroking her chin. Uobami turned her back to him. Very well follow me. She said as she began to slither off once again. Izuku turned back to Momo with a thumb up as Momo nodded. The plan was going well. Earlier that morning. Okay Izuku we're going to be helping you as much as we can to make sure that things go our way. Momo said as she got dressed. Izuku nodded. But how? It's pretty clear that no matter how sympathetic they may be to not kill me they're not willing to sleep with me. He said as Momo nodded. Of course not. They just don't know what they're missing is all. These are the top women of our world Izuku nothing is denied them. It's the classic question of what do you get for the monster who has everything. Something she's never had before. There hasn't been an incubus in the demon realm in centuries. There's no way that they know the feeling of being made love to by one. And that's our angle, curiosity. She said as she stepped up to Izuku. We simply need to entice you Obami. You said she agreed with her mother because she's her mother play to that. Show her how thankful you are. Izuku listened to Momo's plan as she continued along. Her confidence was infectious honestly and even Izuku was starting to feel like this would work. And so with that confidence in his heart Izuku walked side by side with Uobami not behind her like a docile lamb, nor in front like he was her better but side by side like an equal. Uobami's golden serpent eyes looked in his direction every so often. She found it interesting that he was able to keep pace with her. She didn't have legs so it was hard for a species with legs to match her pace without being able to look at her legs and gauge her speed, but Izuku seemed to have no problem at all. Izuku's eyes moved and locked with hers for a moment. She'd been staring too long and been caught. She turned away and then mentally chastised herself. Why was she the one looking away? She thought before stopping in front of a door that she pushed open and presented a wide open courtyard. There were jungle plants flowing all over the area with brilliant colored flowers. He could see serpents of many colors and sizes hanging from the vines and flowing across the ground. In the middle of the room was a large pond the surface was covered with leaves and Izuku could see ripples forming as snakes swam across its surface. Beautiful, he said as Uobami nodded as she looked at the enclosure. It is isn't it, she said turning to look at him and finding him gazing at her. She felt a small rush of heat across her face as she realized he'd been facing her when he said that. She shook her head slightly bringing herself under control. Nice try, but it'll take more than flattery for you to succeed here, she said turning her back and leaving the sanctuary. Izuku walked after her catching up to her side. I know, but I think it still had to be said. He stated as he took in Uobami's form the series of colors in her scales and her golden eyes and hair. She was the picture of a serpent goddess. They walked for several minutes before stepping into what was clearly a throne room. But it seemed to have been made into more of a relaxation space. The throne had been removed and the dais had been adorned with blankets and pillows. This is where I spend most of my time. She said as Izuku looked at the wide open space and noticed that a window shone light directly onto Uobami's throne. How do you spend your time? Izuku asked as Uobami shrugged. Reading mostly a lot of the reading material was destroyed after this kingdom fell. But some of it still remains and I've been reading through it in my spare time when I'm not leading the snake and reptile people of this land or tending to my snake. Izuku looked around and noticed unlike her mother Uobami didn't have any servants in her home. It was just her and her serpents. You take care of all of them on your own. He asked. During his time here he'd seen several dozen snakes here and then of course Jormungandr himself must require a lot of time to care for. Uobami shrugged at his question. They mostly take care of themselves when it comes to food, but if they're injured or when they shed I help them. It's mostly during the winter months when I have to take special care of them. Izuku nodded remembering that in a book he once read said that snakes couldn't stand the cold and would freeze to death very easily. I see well thank you for the tour, but I should check in on my companions and think about what to make for dinner. He said as Uobami arched a brow. You're going to cook. She asked as Izuku smiled. I may not look it but I can cook somewhat. I'm no palace chef but I can get by I would like if you joined us. But if you prefer to eat alone then I understand. Until then my lady I leave you for now. He said with a small bow before moving around the corner leaving Uobami somewhat confused. But also curious as to just what this young man had in store for her. Izuku returned to the bedroom he'd be sharing with the girls and opened the door to find them all looking very refreshed. They turned to him and smiled. How has it been going Izuku? Momo asked as she finished drying her hair. 
He wasn't sure why, but the sight of a girl with damp hair fresh from a shower seemed almost naughty in a way. It was as if he was peeking into a secret garden for a sight only he would appreciate. It took him a moment to refocus before he spoke. I think it's going well I've been sticking to the plan. I plan on making dinner tonight, but I'm not sure if she has any food stored up or where the kitchen is I forgot to ask. He said scratching his head as he chastised himself for overlooking such crucial things. It's alright Izuku you can't be expected to remember everything. And I'm sure it won't be that hard to find her kitchen and larder, right Yurara? Momo said catching the attention of the young kobold who stood up and smiled. No problem master I'll sniff it out for you. Yurara said walking past Izuku and out into the hall. He was able to get a whiff of whatever soap she'd used as she did so. It was a nice scent really. He hadn't looked in the bathroom, but apparently, Yuobami had prepared bathing materials. She really was quite nice. Izuku walked behind Yurara as she weaved back and forth down the hall sniffing the air. It's not too much for you right Yurara? He asked as the kobold smiled over her shoulder. Of course not master the place mostly smells like a snake, but I am getting the scent of spices coming from this way. She stated as she rounded a corner and continued on. Eventually, they came to a pair of double doors and walked in. They were presented with a large kitchen that was actually clear of the foliage that adorned the rest of the castle. He walked inside and looked around seeing pots and pans that weren't in the best of conditions, but would be sufficient for his use. Good job Urara. He said as he rubbed her head making sure to give her ears a good scratching as he did so. Yurara growled in pleasure as she wriggled under her master's touch. Izuku continued to scratch her for a few moments more before walking over to the dishes. A little elbow grease and these should look good as new. He said as he gathered some of the pots and pans. He noticed a push wheel of some kind in the corner of the room and went over to it. I've seen these in books before. He said as Yurara cocked her head to the side. What does it do? She asked as Izuku walked over to it. He began to inspect the wheel seeing that it hadn't been used in what he would guess was over a century. Well if it still works it should deliver water to this basin. He said grabbing the wheel and beginning to pull it to the left. It didn't budge at first, but Izuku continued to pull on the wheel. He dug his feet into the ground and pulled with his back muscles. There was a squeal as the wheel began to budge slowly but steadily. Yurara covered her sensitive ears as the squeal grew louder. After two full revolutions, the squeal gave way to a low rumble. Izuku stopped turning the wheel as the spout vibrated gently before a dark brown liquid gushed out of it. I don't think we should use that water to cook husband, Ashdito said rubbing her head as she walked into the kitchen. Izuku sighed. Yeah, you're probably right Ashido. He said as he watched the basin steadily fill with brown murky water. But with a little more patience Izuku saw the water begin to run clean. Oh good it does have clean water. Momo said as she grabbed a pot set it under the now clean running water and began to scrub it out. I'll wash, Ashido you dry. She said as the pink slime saluted. Okay. She said as she stood guard by Momo's side waiting for the first dish to be handed to her. Izuku looked at the two before looking at Yurara. Well, I guess it's up to you and me to gather the firewood and dinner. He said rubbing Yurara's head. I'm going to need your nose for this Yurara. He said as the cobbled yipped in glee. Of course, master leave it to me. She shouted as she led Izuku out of the ruined castle and into the jungle proper. None of the four noticed a snake lying along the top of a cabinet staring at them intently. Iwabami sat on her throne her eyes closed as she watched her guests work in the kitchen. She'd never had much interest in the castle kitchen mostly because it wasn't friendly to her serpentine form. The narrow walkways meant she'd have to continuously coil herself around the kitchen, but seeing the four of them work together so fluidly was an interesting sight. She scratched her chin as she came back to her own vision. So he wants to cook me dinner. Does he think that will be enough to overcome me or maybe he's going to slip something into the food to make me aroused and take advantage of that? She hissed as she crossed her arms. Maybe I shouldn't eat with them. She said dragging the tip of her tail across the flagstones. No, I can't be absent from the dinner that would be too much like admitting I'm fearful. I have to show up and make my presence known. I am the mistress of this castle after all. I am the vanguard for this trial. If I can hold out for a year then none of my sisters will have to put up with this. Having him in my home for a year is not ideal, but it's a burden I have to carry. It wasn't like she thought her sisters weren't competent enough to deal with this boy, well except Iri and Himiko. She had no doubt that those two would throw themselves at his feet as soon as he stepped foot in their domain. She sighed as she shook her head. I should relax if I'm this worrisome about him now I'll never survive a year with him. She said as she took a deep breath and grabbed a book. I'll just put him out of my mind for the moment. She resolved herself as she cracked open her book. Izuku and Yurara returned several hours later having caught some kind of jungle boar. Izuku had never seen a creature like this, but it looked very similar to a pig, so he hoped its meat would behave the same way. He hadn't had a knife to butcher the pig in the woods, but thanks to Yurara's claws and strength they were at least able to disembowel it there. 
He carried the boar over his shoulders while Urara carried the firewood he looked at the smiling bloodstained cobble. Hey, Urara you should put that firewood in the kitchen and then go wash up in the room while I get to work on dinner. He said. She happily nodded before heading into the kitchen ahead of him within a few moments she was bounding out of the kitchen and heading to the room the four of them shared. Izuku hauled the dead pig into the kitchen and was stunned by the now clean space he walked into. The foliage and dirt that had taken over the kitchen from years of disuse were gone. The pans that could be salvaged were now clean and ready to use and there were fresh stacks of firewood under the stoves and oven. Momo had just set the last pan down when he walked in. Oh, Izuku you came back just in time. She said as she walked over noticing the boar-like creature on his shoulder. Looks like your hunting was successful. Izuku set the dead creature down on a nearby counter as he looked around the clean kitchen. As successful as your cleaning, you and Ashido did really good work Momo. He said as he began to rummage through the drawers looking for a knife. He found a decent looking one and came back to the boar. Momo looked over his shoulder as he began to butcher the large boar. You're quite skilled with a knife Izuku are you a hunter in the human world? She asked. Izuku shook his head. No way. But a friend of mine did a lot of hunting when we were kids before he went off to become a knight. He didn't really teach me how to do it, but I watched him enough so I think I can do a decent job. He said as he skinned and portioned out the boar. Would you mind starting a fire under a large pot of water? He asked as Momo nodded only for a pot to fall from its hook as Ashido pulled it free. Apparently, the slime had been hanging out in said pot. I've got you, husband. She shouted as she went over to fill the pot while Momo set one of the fire stacks ablaze. Izuku gave a nod of gratitude as he continued to butcher the boar. Kaken's mom was a hunter and she'd taught him pretty well and though Katsuki hadn't been willing to share those techniques he was more than willing to show off how to do it and Izuku had watched intently. Once the boar was prepared he took some of the meat off the leg and chopped it into blocks before going over to the boiling water and scraped the meat into the pot. Do we have any seasonings guys? He asked as Momo and Ashido looked at one another. Not many but I've brought a few with me, Momo said as she took off her hat and flipped it over. She began to rummage around the innards of the hat going down all the way to her elbow before pulling out several small containers. Izuku smiled happily. Amazing Momo, he said as he took the spices and added them before stirring the pot. No one notices Izuku's aura traveling from him down to the spoon and into the soup. Iwabami stretched as she woke up from her nap. She'd fallen asleep after reading. She couldn't help it the sunshine had made her feel so warm and comfortable. As she rubbed her face she caught the whiff of something absolutely delectable. What is that smell? She asked as she slithered from her throne of pillows and used her tongue to follow the smell. Her mouth watered slightly as the smell grew. Soon enough she found herself in front of the dining room. That's right the boy said he would prepare dinner for me. Well, I'm here so I might as well grace them with my presence. She said as she began to touch herself up. I'm not doing this for him, I always look my best no matter the circumstance. She told herself as she walked into the dining room Yuobami always took her meals in the throne room or in her bedroom. The dining room had been yet another neglected corner of her home. She was coming to think that maybe she should take better care of her domain. But it seemed the boy and his companions had taken it upon themselves to clean the dining room. The flagstones were free of moss and leaves the foliage on the walls had been trimmed down to a respectable length and the table had been scrubbed clean. Izuku was placing a large pot in the middle of the table as she entered. He smiled at her as if he'd been expecting her. Thank you for coming Lady Yuobami. Izuku said as he gave a small bow. She'd say this at least the boy had great etiquette. That meant a lot in her book if he had that he could go far or at the least would never embarrass her mother in high society events. I just happened to smell what you had cooked and decided to see what you had made. That is all. She stated firmly. She wasn't coming just to see him. Once more Izuku gave her a gentle smile. Of course, it is as you say. Would you like to take a seat? He asked pulling out her chair for her. She looked at him as she slithered over and sat down allowing him to push in her chair. She was wary of his touch. The boy was a young incubus, but potent as well if he was able to overwhelm Ryukyu she had no doubt he would be able to do the same to her. But it seemed she had no cause for concern as he withdrew from her without the slightest of touches. She was, disappointed, not just relieved she supposed. Besides, if he had tried to touch her she was sure that she could summon her snakes to restrain him and give her time to create distance. As she was thinking of this Izuku grabbed a bowl before heading to the pot and ladling out two portions into the bowl which he brought back to Yuobami. She looked at the bowl before her curiously. Oh right, he said catching her attention before grabbing a spoon and scooping out a bite before eating it. I wouldn't poison you or anything, but just to make sure you know, he said after swallowing and offering her the spoon. She looked at the spoon and then at him before reaching for it. Wait I ate off this spoon I should get you another one, he said before Yuobami snatched it from his grasp. Enough stop all the fussing it's a simple spoon and besides at the moment there's nothing you have that could affect me. Yuobami was one of the most powerful serpent species and as such she was immune to poison. She sat as Izuku blushed looking between her and the spoon. 
She was right a secondhand kiss was a childish thought and he was no longer a child. He shouldn't be thinking about such silly things and just focus on the task at hand. Master I'm starving can we eat now? Irara said as Izuku looked up. Of course, sorry about that. Guys I just wanted to show you Obami the proper respect and serve her first. Go ahead and eat. He said making his way to an empty seat several away from Yuobami no doubt giving her space so she wouldn't feel uneasy or suspicious around him. Not that she needed such consideration. What exactly is this? She asked picking up the spoon Izuku had eaten from. As he ladled his own serving of stew Izuku looked up. It's boar stew or at least I'd like to think it is. It was the only thing we were able to hunt that I actually had experience with eating and cooking. Yuobami nodded as she looked at the bowl before taking a bite. It was passable nothing to get excited over, but there was something there that made her want another bite. She could feel it a certain sensation that seemed to transcend taste. The stew he'd cooked made her feel something deep down in her core. She wasn't sure what it was, but whatever it was seemed to only be affecting her. Izuku had eaten the first bite and he was fine and his companions were seemingly enjoying their meal as much as her. Before she knew it she had cleaned her bowl and felt even hungrier than before if that was possible she looked at the pot before standing up and serving herself again. Izuku glanced her way but said nothing before turning away to continue a conversation he was having with the slot. She was grateful for that after the performance she put on it would be well within his rights to at least give her a smirk of pride that she enjoyed his food. But no he simply let her be as she sat back down and ate another bowl of stew. It was actually quite nice. Iwabami was used to eating alone or with her snakes. Echidnas like many of the serpentine races were solitary creatures aside from their husbands if they chose one. After eating her second bowl Yuobami stood up and hearing the rustling of her scales Izuku stood up to take her bowl having already finished his. I'll take care of this. I hope you enjoyed the meal milady. Izuku said with a simple bow. The Echidna looked at the boy inside as she slithered past him. Just call me Yuobami. She said as she began to exit the room. As you wish Yuobami. He said as the last of her tail slithered around the corner. The quartet waited in silence for a moment before Yurara gave a nod. She's gone. She said as Momo gave a smile. Well done master I think this is working, she said as Izuku looked at Momo. But how long will it take? I still have a lot more women to convince, he said as Momo shook her head. Izuku this is something that can't be rushed in fact if it takes longer than we expect then that would be even better. Izuku cocked his head at that statement. Momo stood up. Izuku I know it seems like the best way to do this is to just blast through them as fast as possible. But the faster you go through them the more of a threat you'll seem. If you struggle hard with Yuobami or at least seem to then the others are more likely to let down their guards. And besides we'll make up the time when it comes to Iri and the Vampire Queen. They are firmly in your corner and will be eager to give themselves to you. So don't worry about the time and just take things at the pace you're comfortable with. She said rubbing his head. Izuku smiled as he carried his and Yuobami's bowls to the kitchen. Momo watched him go as he looked to Yurara and Ashido practically drowning themselves in the stew Izuku had made. It was delicious Momo couldn't deny that. But this seemed almost like magic with how she still craved more. She walked over to the stew waved her hand over it and saw a distinct green shimmer ripple throughout it. She sighed with an exasperated smile. Well, that was unexpected, but not unwelcome. Izuku still needs better control of his mana he lets it seep into everything. She said with a chuckle before placing the lid on the pot denying her compatriots any more of the intoxicating meal. That's enough ladies if you eat any more of this you're going to be too full to move and too horny to think straight. She said as Ashido and Yurara both gave her sad, pleading eyes. I'm not Izuku those don't work on me. Now come on we should go get the bedroom ready Izuku will be retiring soon and as his wives. We should welcome him to his bedroom as one. The other two nodded happily at that immediately perking up at the mention of welcoming Izuku into bed. Izuku was in the kitchen washing out the bowls as he thought about Momo's words. She has a point if I try to rush things it'll probably come off bad. I don't want to treat this like morning chores where I try to get them done as quickly as possible so he can move on to the next. This was serious, but it also involved another person. He knew Yuobami had no feelings for him, but he had to try and overcome that to overcome her. He scratched his head. That seemed kind of wrong by his human standards, but she was a monster and this was just daily life here. She was beautiful through that blonde hair of hers and the tricolor scales on her sensuous lower body. He really was changing before he wouldn't have been attracted to someone like Yuobami not because she was ugly, but because she wasn't human, but after making love to a slime. And a cobbled he couldn't help but wonder what it would be like to thrust deep into Yuobami's pussy to feel her coils wrapping around him as made love to her. He issued a deep sigh as he felt a deep insistence burn in his core. I'm hungry, he said simply as he placed the now clean bowls on the counter to dry. The stew would keep for the night he supposed right now he had something else to attend to. Yuobami retired to her bedroom for the night Jormungandr was coiled into a pile by the door. He would be up in a few hours once the sun went down to prowl around for his own dinner tonight. If they were smart those four would heed her words and not venture out into the castle at night let alone into the jungle. 
She gave his large head a couple of strokes before retiring to her bed for the night. She wasn't sure why, but she was incredibly sleepy. She must have eaten too much of that stew. She slithered into the large bed as she lay down her golden hair splayed out around her head like a halo. She gave a yawn before turning on her side and drifting off nearly immediately. She woke up the next morning and gave a stretch before slithering out of bed. That had been the best sleep of her life and now she felt in need of a bath. She left her room to find the large bathing area in the castle. It was one of the only places in the castle she deigned to maintain of her own volition. She removed the shawl that covered her breasts and the small skirt that draped her waist before sliding into the warm water. She hissed in satisfaction as she poured the warm water over her arms and ran her wet fingers through her hair. Yes, she hissed as she sunk lower only to feel strong firm hands and her hair massaging her scalp. She jumped looking back and seeing Izuku there smiling at her. She moved to create distance between them and cover herself but he grabbed her shoulder and brought her back to him. Where are you going? He asked as he once again began to play with her scalp and gods did it feel good. WH what are you doing here? She mumbled trying to pull away, but finding her body not responding in fact it was doing the exact opposite and pushing her into his embrace as his hand moved from her head to her chin and tilted her head up. Don't act confused you know exactly why I'm here. You brought me here, he whispered before he kissed her. Yuobami leaned back but Izuku captured her lips wrapped a hand around her waist and pulled her closer to him. She could feel his bulge pressed up against her scales. She felt him bite her lip as he kissed her more ravaging her mouth before he pulled back with those green eyes staring into her golden eyes. Izuku slithered down her body before capturing one of her nipples in his mouth while his hand teased the other. She moaned and closed her eyes as the pleasure ripped through her. Her tail writhed under the water creating waves on its surface. That's what I like to see, Izuku whispered as he pulled away from her nipple. His hand traveled down her body and she knew where he was headed. This was her last chance to stop him, but she didn't. She stared into his glowing green eyes as she felt his fingers enter her. She moaned arching her back as he speared her core with his fingers pressing deeper into her. Oh, oh, oh. Yuobami gasped as he fingered her furiously. Her tail rose up from the water splashing them both as it wriggled around like a worm. She gripped the edge of the tub as she thrust back against Izuku's fingers wanting more of them inside her. He just watched the pleasure take over her body and smirked. He was holding back teasing her keeping her on the edge for his own enjoyment. She hissed at him but refused to give voice to her desire. Not that she needed to when it seemed like he would keep her in the state indefinitely Izuku suddenly flicked her clit and that sent a jolt of pure unadulterated pleasure lancing through her brain. Yuobami screamed as she woke up and came her blanket growing dark with her moisture. She sat up panting a little as she looked at the large dark spot on her blanket and hissed in frustration. What the hell was that? A wet dream she wasn't a little girl anymore and of all the things she could dream about it was Izuku. Did he do something to her? Had he actually drugged the soup? No that couldn't be it because if it was why would he drug it so that she had wet dreams instead of caving to him physically. That made no sense to her. Was his plan to drive her lust up until she couldn't control herself any longer. It seemed rather devious, but not without its merits. Sitting here and literally stewing in her juices both mentally and literally was doing nothing. She needed a bath. Yuobami slithered out of bed and headed to her bath chamber. As she grabbed hold of the handle she hesitated for a moment. This was exactly how the dream last night started. Would she walk in here and be set upon by Izuku just like the dream? Would she cave to her growing desire and fall to his advances? And why did that thought send a deep throb through her pussy? She hissed in frustration before throwing open the door. She was not about to let some random dream determine her actions. Yuobami walked into the bath chamber and slammed the door with her tail. Izuku opened his eyes as morning sunlight hit his face and a tongue ran up his cock. The fact that he knew without looking that someone was licking his dick was telling in its own way. He gave a hard thrust bumping his soft dick against whoever was helping themselves to his member. He heard a small gasp as Momo's head popped out from under the covers. Having fun Momo? He asked as the young witch blushed. You started it. Apparently, you were having a very fun dream. I noticed when I got up a little bit ago and seeing how close you were I decided to keep you from making a mess of the bed I graciously accepted your morning donation. Izuku smirked and ran his hand through her hair. Thank you I can't quite remember who was in the dream, but you were right it was sexual. But at the same time I feel like it wasn't my dream if that makes sense. He said as Momo smiled straddling him. It does you are coming into your incubus powers and one of those powers is the ability to invade people's dreams specifically women and ravage them in their minds. In the human world, it's like foreplay for incubi a way to whittle a woman down and make her crave you without having to risk exposing yourself. Momo did her best to convey all this in a whisper so as not to wake the other two occupants in the bed. Hirara and Ashido were still sleeping soundly. Izuku saw her look over at the two of them before grabbing her and pulling her close to his face. There now you don't have to worry about waking them up by talking loud. He said as he felt her hefty breasts squish against his chest. Momo could feel his heartbeat through her breasts. 
and the heat of his crotch against hers. She had to admit this much close contact was really making her moist. Izuku noticed as he kissed her nose. Only if you can do it quietly. He whispered. Momo nodded as she moved into position raising herself up before skewering herself on Izuku's hefty cock. Momo bit her lip to suppress a loud moan as Izuku spread her open with such ease. Just like the rest of her, her pussy yielded to him. She let out a shuddering breath once he was fully inside her. Oh, Izuku you feel so good. She moaned as she began to move grinding up and down his cock feeling him press deep into her pussy. Momo had been quite patient and now Izuku was finally giving her what she was hungry for. Izuku gripped her hips slamming his length into her repeatedly over and over filling her with his cock. Momo leaned back as her heaving breasts jumped with each impact into her. Slowly the two began to forget about being quiet as the pleasure consumed them. The mattress rocked from their movements as their rhythm picked up speed until the bed frame began to creak under the movement. Momo's mind had gone to mush as she leaned down and looked at Izuku his eyes were glowing fiercely as his fingers dug deeply into her hips and he gave another powerful thrust driving his length deep into her pussy and filling it with his thick cum. Momo could feel it permeate her womb as her body began to consume the mana within it. It was so rich and thick as it filled her. Oh, Izuku. She moaned as another shot blasted against the back of her womb painting her insides white. Her fingers gripped the sheets as several more shots of cum erupted inside of her. Momo straddled Izuku panting as she pressed down on him making sure his cum was as deep inside her as possible. That feels so good. She whispered before stroking Izuku's chest as the two stared at one another. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself, Izuku said stroking Momo's cheek and pulling her in for a kiss. That looked like it felt really good, Yurara said as she sat up her fur and hair looking seriously must. Momo smiled as she pulled off Izuku's cock and stroked the cobbled's hair. It was, but now we need to get you a good brushing, she said reaching into her hat and pulling out a brush. Izuku smiled as Momo began to brush Yurara's head only to gasp as he felt Ashido wrap her mouth around his cock cleaning off any residual juices on his cock both his and Momo's. Ashido pulled back and licked her lips as she looked at him. Thanks Ashido, he said kissing her cheek as he crawled out of bed. I'm going to take a shower and then get breakfast, he said as he went into the bathroom. Yuobami got out of the bath and got dressed. She felt slightly less on edge now after a hot bath. Now she was hungry for actual food. She moved down the hall to the dining room and saw the pot sitting on the table. She bit her lip remembering the silky rich taste of the stew on her tongue. She gave a hard swallow before turning away. No, it was probably that stew that gave me that weird dream. She said as she moved along to the garden where her snakes congregated. She climbed up a nearby pillar to grab hold of several fruits. She used her powerful lower body to grip the pillar as she stretched herself out grabbing a couple of bananas and a pop before slithering back down and heading to her throne room. Yuobami rounded the corner to her throne room and saw the last person she expected to see there. Izuku was looking over the stack of books by her throne. His hair was still damp telling her he'd just showered. She could smell the clean soap smell on him even from here. Apparently he could feel her eyes on him and turned to look at her. His green eyes looked over her gently not the judgmental eyes she'd seen in other men that she'd preyed upon. He smiled at her and stood up straight. Good morning Yuobami. He said as he stepped away from her throne and books as he walked over to her. She stood a little taller as he approached. Yes good morning to you as well. She said as she looked at him and then at her stack of books. Noticing the look he smiled again. Sorry, but I remembered that you said you liked to read and I wanted to see if I had read any of them as well. He explained and before she could think better of it she spoke. And had you? She asked and then bit her lip. Izuku looked at her and scratched his head. Unfortunately not, but I've heard of them. These are all very old books that other people wanted to read or were of historical importance. Whatever this kingdom was it was lost to humanity a long time ago. He said setting one of the books down. Still the fact that you have such important books says a lot about how well read you are. You could probably teach some of the scholars in the capital a thing or two. He said as he walked towards her. Well, I'll leave you to your reading. As he walked past her Yuobami lifted her tail and held it aloft in front of the boy barring his path. Izuku stopped short of touching her tail and then looked at her. Green eyes met gold for a moment. If you want, I'll let you read a few of them. I've read most of them so there's no reason for you not to. Maybe you two will gain some ancient knowledge the intellectuals of the human realm can only dream about. She said as she slithered up to her throne. Izuku took a moment to think about her words before walking back to the several stacks of books. Of course, you'll have to stay here to read them. I don't want you taking them out of my sight. These books are ancient treasures of course, she said with a slight dusting of pink on her face and a prideful smile. Izuku looked at the back of her head as she spoke before shrugging. That's fine with me, he said as he grabbed a book and then sat down next to her throne and opened the book. Yuobami bit her lip as she coiled herself onto her throne and grabbed the book she was reading yesterday. It took several minutes of trying to read the same paragraph over and over she finally looked over to Izuku. She looked at the spiral of his green hair before leaning back to see his profile as he read. 
She watched his green eyes move left and right as he read. She had to admit this was nice. Having him at her side and being able to watch him in such a natural position was comforting. She remembered the dream she had last night and bit her lip. She was starting to fall for him and he wasn't even doing anything special. 